Before I call the Prime Minister, it is with the greatest sadness that I rise to say a few words in tribute to Her Late Majesty, Queen Elizabeth. Almost all of us in the House have experienced no other monarch, this country's throne, but Her Late Majesty. Though indeed only a score or so members in this House will have already been born, let alone who can recall a time when she was not the Queen. She is wedded in our minds with the Crown and all it stands for. After accession in February 1952, she first came to the Palace of Westminster to open the session of Parliament in November 1952, when Winston Churchill was the Prime Minister and Speaker William Morrison was in the chair almost 70 years ago. 57 complete sessions of Parliament have passed since then, and as she was here to open all but three of them, as parliamentarians, we have celebrated with her for silver, golden, diamond jubilees, and of course, marked her platinum jubilee this year, in which the lamp standards have been unveiled in New Palace Yard. In this place, her reign saw 10 different speakers occupy the chair during her reign. There were 18 general elections and I'm sure the Prime Minister will remind of us how many of her predecessors she welcomed to, and always, I'm sure, with quiet wisdom. As the longest serving monarch country has known, she would have been assured of a notable entry in our history books, even were it not for the magnificence in which she undertook the role as Queen, but for a magnificent service and what a service that entailed not just as head of the nation, but head of the Commonwealth, head of the armed forces and supreme governor of the Church of England. Over her reign, she has seen unprecedented social, cultural, technological change. Through it all, she was the most conscientious and dutiful of monarchs. But while she understood the inescapable nature of duty, which sometimes must have weighed upon her heavily. She also delighted in carrying it out, for she was the most devoted monarch. As well as queen, she was a wife, a mother, a grandmother and great-grandmother. Roles she carried out with the same sense of vocation, as well as human kindness, as the role of queen. Her life, without unhappiness and troubles, but our memories of her will be filled with that image of a gently smiling dedication that showed throughout her life. Indeed, while this is a time of very considerable sadness, those memories of a noble, gracious lady who devoted her life to her family, the United Kingdom, and those nations around the world whom she served as Queen will bring us some consolation and joy. My deepest sympathies with His Majesty, the King, and other members of the royal family to whom I commend all our sincere condolences and support at this very, very sad time. Yay. Order. We are meeting today for tributes to Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth. I would like to inform the House that we will sit today until approximately 10 p.m. for tributes. At approximately six o'clock, the House will be suspended while His Majesty, the King, makes his broadcast to the nation. Members present will be able to watch the broadcast on screens in the chamber. We will then resume our proceedings to continue with tributes. The House will then sit again tomorrow at one o'clock. The first business will be all taking for a small number of senior members. Members to be invited to take the oath tomorrow are being contacted by my office. All other members will have an opportunity to take the oath when the House returns. After oath taking tomorrow, tributes will be continued. The House is expected to sit till approximately 10 pm. The House is not expected to sit on Sunday. I now call the Prime Minister, Elizabeth Truss. Mr Speaker, in the hours since last night's shocking news, we have witnessed the most heartfelt outpouring of grief 
at the loss of Her Late Majesty, the Queen. Crowds have gathered, flags have been lowered to half-mast, tributes have been sent from every continent around the world. On the death of her father, King George VI, Winston Churchill said the news had stilled the clatter and traffic of 20th century life in many lands. Now, 70 years later, in the tumult of the 21st century, life has paused again. Her late Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, was one of the greatest leaders the world has ever known. She was the rock on which modern Britain was built. She came to the throne at just 25, in a country that was emerging from the shadow of war. She bequeaths a modern, dynamic nation that has grown and flourished under her reign. The United Kingdom is the great country it is today because of her. The Commonwealth is the family of nations it is today because of her. She was devoted to the union of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. She served 15 countries as head of state and she loved them all. Her words of wisdom gave us strength in the most testing times. During the darkest moments of the pandemic, she gave us hope that we would meet again. She knew this generation of Britons would be as strong as any. And as we meet today, we remember the pledge she made on her 21st birthday to dedicate her life to service. The whole house will agree Never has a promise been so completely fulfilled. Her devotion to duty remains an example to us all. She carried out thousands of engagements. She took a red box every day. She gave her assent to countless pieces of legislation and was at the heart of our national life for seven decades. As Supreme Governor of the Church of England, she drew on her deep faith. She was the nation's greatest diplomat. Her visits to post-apartheid South Africa and to the Republic of Ireland showed a unique ability to transcend difference and heal division. In total, she visited well over 100 countries. She met, she, she met more people than any other monarch in our history. She gave counsel to prime ministers and ministers across government. I have personally greatly valued her wise advice. Only last October, I witnessed firsthand how she charmed the world's leading investors at Windsor Castle. She was always so proud of Britain and always embodied the spirit of our great country. She remained determined to carry out her duties, even at the age of 96. It was just three days ago at Balmoral that she invited me to form a government and become her 15th Prime Minister. Again, she generously shared with me her deep experience of government, even in those last days. Everyone who met her will remember the moment. They will speak of it for the rest of their lives. Even those who never met her, her late Majesty's image is an icon for what Britain stands for as a nation. On our coins, on our stamps, and in portraits around the world. Her legacy will endure through the countless people she met, the global history she witnessed, and the lives that she touched. She was loved and admired by people across the United Kingdom and across the world. One of the reasons for that affection was her sheer humanity. She reinvented monarchy for the modern age. She was a champion of freedom and democracy around the world. She was dignified, but not distant. She was willing to have fun, whether on a mission with 007 or having tea with Paddington Bear. She brought the monarchy into people's lives and into people's homes. During her first televised Christmas message in 1957, she said, today we need a special kind of courage so we can show the world that we are not afraid of the future. We need that courage now. In an instant yesterday, our lives changed forever. Today, we show the world that we do not fear what lies ahead. 
we send our deepest sympathy to all members of the royal family. We pay tribute to our late Queen and we offer loyal service to our new King. His Majesty, King Charles III, bears an awesome responsibility that he now carries for all of us. I was grateful to speak to His Majesty last night and offer my condolences. Even as he mourns, his sense of duty and service is clear. He has already made a profound contribution through his work on conservation, education and his tireless diplomacy. We owe him our loyalty and devotion. The British people, the Commonwealth and all of us in this House will support him as he takes our country forward to a new era of hope and progress, our new Carolean age. The crown endures, our nation endures, and in that spirit I say, God save the King. I now call the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Today, our country, our people, this House, are united in mourning. Queen Elizabeth II was this great country's greatest monarch. And for the vast majority of us, it feels impossible to imagine a Britain without her. All our thoughts are with her beloved family, our royal family, at this moment of profound grief. This is a deep and private loss for them, yet it's one we all share, because Queen Elizabeth created a special personal relationship with us all. That relationship was built on the attributes that defined her reign, her total commitment to service and duty, her deep devotion to the country, the Commonwealth, and the people she loved. In return for that, we loved her. And it is because of that great shared love that we grieve today. For the 70 glorious years of her reign, our Queen was at the heart of this nation's life. She did not simply reign over us. She lived alongside us. She shared in our hopes and our fears our joy and our pain, our good times and our bad. Our Queen played a crucial role as the thread between the history we cherish and the present we own. A reminder that our generational battle against the evil of fascism or the emergence of a new Britain out of the rubble of the Second World War do not only belong to the past but are the inheritance of each and every one of us. A reminder that the creativity, the hard work, the enterprise that has always defined this nation is as abundant now as it ever was. A reminder that the prospect of a better future still burns brightly. Never was this link more important than when our country was plunged into lockdown at the start of the pandemic. Her simple message that we would see family again, that we would see friends again, that we would be together again, gave people strength and courage when they needed it most. But it wasn't simply the message that allowed a shaken nation to draw upon those reserves. It was the fact that she was the messenger. COVID closed the front doors of every home in the country. It made our lives smaller and more remote. But she was able to reach beyond that, to reassure us and steal us. At the time we were most alone, at a time we'd been driven apart, she held the nation close in a way no one else could have done. Yeah. For that, we say thank you. On the occasion of the Queen's Silver Jubilee in 1977, Philip Larkin wrote of her reign, In times when nothing stood, 
but worsened or grew strange. There was one constant good. She did not change. It feels like we are once again in a moment in our history where, as Larkin put it, things are growing strange, where everything is spinning, a nation requires a still point. When times are difficult, it requires comfort. And when direction is hard to find, it requires leadership. The loss of our Queen robs this country of its stillest point, its greatest comfort, at precisely the time we need those things most. But our Queen's commitment to us, her life of public service, was underpinned by one crucial understanding, that the country she came to symbolise is bigger than any one individual or any one institution. It is the sum total of all our history and all our endeavours, and it will endure. The late Queen would have wanted us to redouble our efforts, to turn our collar up and face the storm, to carry on. Most of all, she would want us to remember that it is in these moments that we must pull together. This House is a place where ideas and ideals are debated. Of course, that leads to passionate disagreement. Of course, temperatures can run high. But we all do it in pursuit of something greater. We do it because we believe we can make this great country and its people greater still. At this moment of uncertainty, where our country feels caught between a past it cannot relive and a future yet to be revealed, we must always remember one of the great lessons of our Queen's reign, that we are always better when we rise above the petty, the trivial, the day-to-day, -day, to focus on the things that really matter, the things that unite us, rather than those which divide us. Yeah. Our Elizabethan age may now be over, but her legacy will live on forever. And as the children of that era, it falls upon us to take that legacy forward, to show the same love of country, the love of one another, as she did. To show empathy and compassion, as she did. And to get Britain through this dark night and bring it into the dawn, as she did. We join together today not just to say goodbye to our Queen, to share in our mourning, but to say something else important. God save the King, because as one era ends, so another begins. King Charles III has been a devoted servant of this country his entire life. He has been a powerful voice for fairness and understood the importance of the environment long before many others. As he ascends to his new role, with the Queen Consort by his side, the whole house, indeed the whole country, will join today to wish him a long, happy and successful reign. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the emotions we see across the nation today are echoed across the Commonwealth to which our Queen was so committed, in the church to which our Queen was so devoted, and in the armed forces which she led and her family served. Around the world, people will be united in mourning for her passing, and united in celebrating her life. We've already seen beautiful tributes flow from across the world. It will be impossible to capture them all here. But each one is a reminder of the esteem in which she was held, of what she achieved on behalf of her country, of the shared values we treasure. The reason our loss feels so profound is not just because she stood at the head of our country for 70 years, but because, in spirit, she stood amongst us. As we move forward, as we forge a new path, as we build towards a better future, she will always be with us. For all she gave us and all she will continue to give us, we say thank you. May our Queen rest in peace.
God save the King. I now call on the Father of the House, Sir Peter Bottomley. <coughs> Constituents will wish me briefly to record their love, respect and gratitude to Her Late Majesty. We can give continuing life to her values and virtues of kindness, aspiration, perseverance and pride. We thank her, we miss her, and we should say what she would wish, God save the King. I now call on the leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is, of course, with great sadness that we unite to offer our prayers, focus our sorrow and gather our collective thoughts on the passing of Her Majesty the Queen. On behalf of the Scottish National Party, I would like to offer my condolences as we hold the Queen and her family in our thoughts and prayers at this difficult time. The grief and mourning which reverberates around this chamber and across the world will be all the more acute for the King and members of the Royal Family. Only they can understand the deep personal loss of a close family member and people across society who have similarly lost loved ones will understand the pain that they must feel as we ensure our heartfelt condolences are with them today. Over the coming days, people up and down these islands will seek to come to terms in their own private way with the loss of one of the true constants in all our lives. In that regard, my thoughts are also with our own Prime Minister, just days into office, and having to come to terms with the enormity of the loss of the head of state and show the leadership that is now required in her position. We can also help but dwell on the late Queen, who right to the end fulfilled her duty by appointing the new Prime Minister. But of course, many will feel this as a deeply personal loss, for the Queen's continuous and abiding presence and the leadership she has shown over seven decades will be the enduring marker to the remarkable tenure as our Head of State. (coughs) Her Majesty the Queen has been Head of State for longer than most of us have been alive, and the majority of us have never known a public life without the Queen at the helm. For many, she has been a steady hand guiding the ship and a perpetual symbol of stability. Fifteen Prime Ministers and five First Ministers of Scotland have benefited Mm. from her institutional knowledge and, of course, her wise counsel. As the figurehead of the Commonwealth, she was a unifying force, recognised the world over, visiting at least 117 countries, and was committed to celebrating the diverse values and cultures around the globe, all born out of a duty to serve. During her reign, the world has changed immeasurably, through the good times and the bad times, through war and peace, through boom and bust, through the advances in technology and communication and the dawn of the internet age, to many she was a guiding light, ever present as she bore witness to the evolution of these islands into the modern era. A thread of continuity running through the fabric of the Commonwealth, at once tying societies to our shared histories and making new history. I, like many others in this chamber, was fortunate to meet the Queen on a number of occasions and was always struck by the strength, the intellect, the modesty, the humility and often the humour with which she approached her royal duties. And while I have always met her in a professional context as monarch, I'm struck with just how many people across Scotland, and indeed across the United Kingdom, have had a first-hand encounter with the Queen. Whether they have been invited to her Holyrood garden parties or had the pleasure to meet with her in the many hundreds of events, walkabouts or official openings, including that at her Scottish Parliament, or whether she had taken them wholly by surprise, (coughs) with chance encounters on the countryside or villages near Balmoral, people of the length and breadth of Scotland have their own tales of their individual meetings with the Queen. Because she was a monarch who reigned with compassion and integrity and established a deep connection with the public. And the affection which the Queen had for Scotland (coughs) and that Scotland had for the Queen cannot be underestimated. On the Queen's first visit to Scotland following her coronation, the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland said to her, Today, you and I are Scotland, greeting with all that we have to offer of love and duty, our gracious young Queen. We can today look back on these words and say that for as long as Her Majesty reigned, both she and Scotland held true to these values of love and duty for one another. 
Speaking when she reconvened our Scottish Parliament in 1999, Her Majesty set out the obligation on members to set lasting standards of vision and purpose, of debate and discussion, not just for our own generation, but for future generations. And it is clear that members across the Scottish Parliament, and I trust in this place, from all walks of political life, have moved forward with that sense of vision and purpose in mind. There is a deeply held sense of responsibility across political parties to govern for the betterment of future generations, in our case to uphold the values of the Scottish Parliament, which are inscribed in the ceremonial mace. Wisdom, justice, compassion and integrity. The values that set the aspirations for a modern Scotland, the values that so often embodied by Her Majesty herself. And in what was sadly her final ever address to the Scottish Parliament, her love of Scotland and its people was clear when she said, it is the people that make a place, and there are few places where this is truer than it is in Scotland. The relationship between Scotland and the Queen was one of shared admiration. Indeed, whilst she was everyone's Queen, for many in Scotland, she was Elizabeth, Queen of Scots. Her Majesty's roots in Scotland run deep. She was descended from the Royal House of Stuart on both sides, and her family, of course, her mother, was from Glam's and Angus. It is clear that these family ties gave way to a great and enduring affection, and Scotland was a place that was truly held dear to her, not only in an official capacity, but in a private capacity as well. It is well known that Balmoral, with its beautiful and atmospheric scenery, was the Queen's favourite home. Balmoral was a place where she was able to enjoy freedom, peace, and the ability to indulge her love of the great outdoors, whether that was walking with her dogs, riding with horses, hosting picnics and barbecues, or from behind the wheel of her Land Rover. Oh. <laughs> it is clear that Balmoral has been a place of peace and sanctuary for her throughout her whole life, and perhaps particularly so following the death of her husband, life companion and love, His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. <coughs> It is therefore perhaps fitting that she has met her final peace at Balmoral, a place where she found such enjoyment and comfort. And as someone of demonstrably strong faith, she will now have enduring peace with herself and, of course, to be reunited with Prince Philip. Her Majesty was a life of grace and wisdom, defined by its service to the public and by the lives that she touched. Her legacy and her enduring presence will live on, God bless the Queen. May she rest in peace. God bless the King. Boris Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I hope the House will not mind if I begin with a personal confession. A few months ago, the BBC came to see me to talk about Her Majesty the Queen, and we sat down, and the cameras started rolling, and they requested that I should talk about her in the past tense. And I'm afraid I simply choked up and I couldn't go on. I'm really not easily moved to tears. But I was so overcome with sadness that I had to ask them to go away. And I know that today there are countless people in this country and around the world who have experienced the same sudden access of unexpected emotion. And I think millions of us are trying to understand why we are feeling this deep and personal and almost familial sense of loss. Perhaps it's partly that she's always been there, a changeless human reference point in British life. The person who, all the surveys say, appears most often in our dreams, so unvarying in her pole star radiance that we have perhaps been lulled into thinking that she might be in some way eternal. But I think our shock is keener today because we are coming to understand in her death the full magnitude of what she did for us all. And think of what we asked that 25-year-old woman all those years ago. To be the person so globally trusted that her image should be on every unit of our currency, every postage stamp, 
the person in whose name all justice is dispensed in this country, every law passed, to whom every minister of the Crown swears allegiance, and for whom every member of our armed services is pledged, if necessary, to lay down their lives. Think what we asked of her in that moment, not just to be the living embodiment in, in her DNA of the history and continuity and unity of this country, but to be the figurehead of our entire system, the keystone in the vast arch of the British state, a role that only she could fulfil because in the brilliant and durable bargain of the constitutional monarchy, only she could be trusted to be above any party political or commercial interest and to incarnate impartially the very concept and essence of the nation. Think what we asked of her and think what she gave. She showed the world not just how to reign over a people, she showed the world how to give, how to love, and how to serve. And as we look back at that vast arc of service, its sheer duration is almost impossible to take in. She was the last living person in British public life to have served in uniform in the Second World War. She was the first female member of the royal family in a thousand years to serve full-time in the armed forces, and that impulse to do her duty carried her right through into her 10th decade to the very moment in Balmoral, as my right honourable friend has said, only three days ago, when she saw off her 14th Prime Minister <laughs> and welcomed her 15th. And I can tell you, in that audience, she was as radiant and as knowledgeable and as fascinated by politics as ever I can remember, and as wise in her advice as anyone I know, if not wiser. And over that extraordinary span of public service, with her naturally retentive and inquiring mind, I think, and doubtless many of the 15 would agree, that she became the greatest statesman and diplomat of all. And she knew instinctively how to cheer up the nation, how to lead a celebration. I remember her innocent joy more than 10 years ago after the opening ceremony of the London Olympics when I told her that the leader of a friendly Middle Eastern country seemed actually to believe that she had jumped out of a helicopter <laughs> in a pink dress and parachuted into the stadium. And I remember her equal pleasure on being told just a few weeks ago that she had been a smash hit in her performance with Paddington Bear. Yeah. And perhaps more importantly, she knew how to keep us going when times were toughest. In 1940, when this country and this democracy faced the real possibility of extinction, she gave a broadcast, aged only 14, that was intended to reassure the children of Britain. She said then, we know, every one of us, that in the end, all will be well. She was right. And she was right again in the darkest days of the COVID pand pandemic when she came on our screens and told us that we would meet again. And we did. And I now speak for other prime ministers, when I say ex-prime ministers, when I say that she helped to comfort and guide us as well as the nation because she had the patience and the sense of history to see that troubles come and go and that disasters are seldom as bad as they seem. And it was that indomitability, that humour, that work ethic and that sense of history which together made her Elizabeth the Great. And when I call her that, I should add one, Elizabeth the Great, I should add one final quality, of course, which was her humility. Her single bar electric fire Tupperware using refusal to be grand. And unlike us politicians, 
with our outriders and our armour-plated convoys, I can tell you, as a direct eyewitness, that she drove herself in her own car with no detectives and no bodyguard, bouncing at alarming speed <laughs> over the Scottish landscape to the total amazement of the ramblers and the tourists we encountered. And it is that indomitable spirit with which she created the modern constitutional monarchy. An institution so strong and so happy and so well understood, not just in this country, but in the Commonwealth and around the world, that the succession has already seamlessly taken place. And I believe she would regard it as her own highest achievement, that her son, Charles III, will clearly and amply follow her own extraordinary standards of duty and service. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that today we can say with such confidence, God save the King, is a tribute to him, but above all to Elizabeth the Great, who worked so hard for the good of her country, not just now, but for generations to come. That is why we mourn her so deeply. And it is in the depths of our grief that we understand why we loved her so much. Yeah. Yeah. Now come to Mother of the House, Harriet Hum. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And what an excellent speech from the Right Honourable Member for Uxbridge, which I'm sure will have resonated in every member of this House and indeed everyone in this country. It was a brilliant speech. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to make my tribute to the Queen and to do so on my own behalf, but also on behalf of my constituents, particularly those who, coming from Commonwealth countries in Africa and the Caribbean, held the Queen in such high regard. We're a constitutional monarchy, and for we MPs, the Queen was ever present in the interwoven relationship between the monarch and her parliament. She underpinned our democratic system for over 70 years, underpinning it, but never intervening in it. She was always salient, but never meddled. She avoided controversy, not by staying in the background, far from it. She performed her role to the utmost, but she did it by respecting the boundaries. She carried out her duties and gave us her full commitment for us to carry out ours. When many denigrated, she always respected and supported Parliament, and we should be very grateful for that. Between her ministers, and not just prime ministers, there was regular contact. After Labour won the election in 1997, I went up to the palace where, like the other new secretaries of state, she pointed me to the Privy Council and bestowed on me the seals of office. They are actual seals which are given to you and you take back to your department to be locked in a safe. But when just a year later I was sacked, <laughs> taken out uh, of the safe and taken back to Bar Buckingham Palace. Uh, my diary was empty and my phone stopped ringing. Uh, my office was astonished to get a call from Buckingham Palace. No one else wanted to have anything to do with me, but the Queen wanted to see me. I was invited to take, queen, uh, take tea with the Queen for her to thank me for my service as Secretary of State. <laughs> The point, my point is that the relationship between our Queen and Parliament and our Queen and Government was never just on paper, but was always active and always encouraging. She radiated British values of duty, patriotism, internationalism, charity and service. But while she embodied British values, she never intervened in politics. And that is constitutional alchemy, nothing less. Mm -hmm. It's evident that everyone, even those who don't agree with the hereditary principle of the monarchy, cannot but marvel at her personal qualities. Mm -hmm. And I want to marvel at how she could do all this flawlessly, not just over so many decades, 
but as a woman starting her reign in what was emphatically then a man's world. We have to remember what attitudes were at the time. The order of the day was men were in charge and women were subservient. The man was head of the household and the role of a woman was to get married, have his children and support him. In the 1950s, when she was crowned, I was a child and I remember my mother warning me that people thought men knew more than women, that men's views were valuable whilst women's were to be disregarded. And so it was in that atmosphere that she stepped up as a 25-year-old married woman with two children to take her place at the head of this nation and play a huge role on the world stage. What determination and courage that must have taken. Yeah. The prime ministers she dealt with were mostly men, mostly twice her age. <laughs> Things were very different. A huge change has taken place during her reign. Things were very different when six years ago she threw open Buckingham Palace for us to celebrate the 70th anniversary of BBC's Women's Hour to celebrate how much women had achieved. As Sir Tony Blair said, she was the matriarch of this nation, a matriarch for us on the world stage and a matriarch too at home in her own family. <coughs> as well as being our monarch, she was the mother of four children, had many grandchildren and great-grandchildren, and it is to her family that I extend my deepest sympathies for their loss and condolences for their grief, which we all share. Theresa May. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It is with great <laughs> sadness that I rise to pay tribute to Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on my behalf and on behalf of my Maidenhead constituents. Yesterday was a day that we all knew would come some time, but in our hearts of hearts we hoped never would. But as we mourn a beloved monarch, we must always remember that she was a mother a grandmother and a great-grandmother, and my thoughts and prayers are with King Charles III and the whole of the royal family. Yeah. And I also remember the close members of her royal household. Queen Elizabeth II was quite simply the most remarkable person I have ever met. I am sometimes asked, among all the world leaders I met, who was the most impressive? And I have no hesitation in saying <coughs> that from all the heads of state and government, the most impressive person I met was Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. She gave a lifetime of service as she promised to do when she was 21. Her selfless devotion to duty was an inspiration and example to us all. She was respected and loved not just here in the United Kingdom and in her other realms and the Commonwealth, but across the world. And that love, respect and admiration was born not out of her position, but because of the person she was. A woman of dignity and grace, of compassion and warmth, of mischief and joy, of wisdom and experience, and of a deep understanding of her people. Like so many until last evening, I had never known another monarch. She was a constant throughout our lives, always there for us, uniting us at times of difficulty, and as others have said most recently during COVID, when she gave us hope that we would once more come together. Her passing marks a generational change not just because of the length of her service, but because of what she lived through. When we marked the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings in 2019, she was with the world leaders not just as queen, but as someone who had worn uniform during the Second World War, an experience which, quite apart from anything else, had taught her how to strip an engine. <laughs> the queen was always interested in people, 
When she walked into a room, the faces of those present were lit up, and her magnificent smile would calm nerves and put people at their ease. As I said on her Platinum and Jubilee, I saw that at Chogham in 2018, when there was a reception at Windsor before a lunch, and uh, the leaders were gathered and talking amongst themselves, and I knew Her Majesty was going to join the reception, but they didn't. The minute she walked into the room, the sense of love and respect was palpable, and they all turned, and they all wanted to speak to her. They loved her, and she loved the Commonwealth, and the Commonwealth today is a significant part of her legacy. But I also saw that on other occasions, including on what was one of her last, if not the last, appearance she made in public when she came to open Thames Hospice in my Maidenhead constituency in July. The moment she walked through the door, the atmosphere in the room changed. You felt the love and respect of the people there for her. And as she spoke to staff and patients, she exuded a warmth and humanity which put people at their ease. She was queen, but she embodied us. Across the nations of the world and for so many people, meeting Queen Elizabeth simply made their day and for many will be the memory of their life. Mm -hmm. Of course, for those of us who had the honour to serve as one of her Prime Ministers, those meetings were more frequent with the weekly audiences. These were not meetings with a high and mighty monarch, but a conversation with a woman of experience and knowledge and immense wisdom. They were also the one meeting I went to, which I knew would not be briefed out to the media. <laughs> what, uh, what made those audiences so special was the understanding the Queen had of issues, which came from the work she put into her red boxes, combined with her years of experience. She knew many of the world leaders. In some cases, she had known their fathers. <laughs> and she was a wise and adroit judge of people. The conversations at the audiences were special, but so were weekends at Balmoral, where the Queen wanted all her guests to enjoy themselves. And she was a thoughtful hostess. She would take an interest in what books were put in your room. And she didn't always expect to be the centre of attention. She was quite happy sometimes to sit playing her form of patience while others were mingling around her, chatting to each other. My husband tells of the time he had a dream. He dreamt that he was sitting in the back of a Range Rover, being driven around a Balmoral estate, and the driver was Her Majesty the Queen, and the passenger seat was occupied by his wife, the Prime Minister. <laughs> and then he woke up and realised it was reality. <laughs> Her Majesty loved the countryside, and she was down to earth and a woman of common sense. I remember one picnic at Balmoral which was taking place in one of the bothies on the estate. The hampers came from the castle and we all mucked in to put the food and drink out on the table. I picked up some cheese, put it on a plate and was transferring it to the table. The cheese fell on the floor. I had a split second decision to make. <laughs> I picked up the cheese, put it on the plate, and put it on the table. <laughs> and I turned round to see that my every move <laughs> had been watched very carefully by Her Majesty the Queen. <laughs> I looked at her, she looked at me, <laughs> and she just smiled. <laughs> and the cheese remained on the table. <laughs> this is indeed a sad day. But it is also a day of celebration of a life well spent in the service of others. There have been many words of tribute and superlatives used to describe Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, but these are not hype. They are entirely justified. She was our longest serving monarch. She was respected around the world. She united our nation in times of trouble. She joined in our celebrations with joy and a mischievous smile. She gave an example to us all. 
of faith, of service, of duty, of dignity, of decency. She was remarkable, and I doubt we will ever see her like again. May she rest in peace and rise in glory. Yeah. 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 Sir Ed Davy. It's a real pleasure to follow the Right Honourable Lady, and can I congratulate her on her lovely, heartwarming speech. Mr Speaker, Liberal Democrats join members from all sides of the House in expressing our deepest condolences on the passing of Her Majesty the Queen. We are mourning a profound loss. The Queen was a formidable monarch who faithfully served our country for all her
her attitude. I was also fortunate enough to be present um, after the death of uh, our colleague John Smith um, at the commemoration of D-Day on the 50th anniversary and to be in the Queen's company and observe her and her <coughs> utter respect um, for the veterans and for the sacrifice of those days over that period. But as I said, I had many encounters with her as President of the Council and indeed as Foreign Secretary accompanied her on state visits, where, like the uh, Right Honourable Lady, the former Prime Minister, I heard, uh, for example, her observations about the comments made to her by the mother of a former President um, uh, about the, the then uh, present incumbent. And very interesting it was. <laughs> <laughs> so I would just testify to the qualities that, of which everyone else has spoken and to which I'm sure uh, everyone else will give, tes give testimony of her intelligence, her knowledge, her sense of humour. One of my abiding and favourite memories is fairly, not, not very recently, but so of recent years. Um, people will probably recall it's often been on the news. It's one of my favourite clips of, I think, the Duke of Edinburgh was being chased by a persistent bee and there's a picture of the Queen coming through an archway, giggling uncontrollably, and clearly quite unable to suppress how hysterically funny she found it. And I think that very much sums up the person that you could see and admire. She was a remarkable person, a remarkable monarch, and we are the poorer for her going. Yeah. Douglas Ross. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Often this place can be criticised for the debates we have, but I think it has risen to the occasion today in memory of the late uh, Her Majesty the Queen and the contributions from 
uh, all sides of the House show the heartfelt uh, thoughts of members who have had close experience and those of us who have met uh, the Queen very infrequently. Uh, I met uh, the late Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth at the opening of the Scottish Parliament last year uh, and I had a, a short conversation with her as the leader of the main opposition party and she moved on to the other party leaders. Uh, but I have a picture uh, of the Queen shaking my hand with the beaming smile that we saw in her last picture uh, that was taken uh, at Balmoral on Tuesday. And Her Majesty the Queen loved Scotland and Scotland loved Her Majesty the Queen. And I think it is right that that picture it was taken by an excellent Scottish photographer, Jane Barlow, who captured Her Majesty uh, looking very calm, very happy and very at home in Balmoral, which she loved. Uh, I also want to, to speak briefly on behalf of my constituents in Murray, who enjoyed meeting the Queen on many occasions. Uh, the most recent visit, and her last visit to Murray, was in November 2014, when she arrived on the Royal Train at Elgin Train Station, and she went to meet our armed forces at RAF Lossiemouth and at Kinloss Barracks. Because it has been mentioned today, but the armed forces uh, are important and were important to Her Majesty and are important to King Charles III, uh, and will play uh, an extremely important role in the coming days and weeks. But that visit in November 2014 was accompanied uh, with the late Duke of Edinburgh, and it was her 67th wedding anniversary. And it showed that the public commitment to service and the dedication of both Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh, it meant that they went about their duties when others would be celebrating uh, a milestone uh, anniversary. But that was what the Queen provided commitment and dedication at every opportunity to deliver for people across the country. We will, over the next few days uh, and weeks, uh, remember that commitment from Her Majesty the Queen, and we will, in our thoughts and our prayers, think about King Charles III and the royal family, who are grieving the loss of a loving mother, grandmother and great-grandmother. But as we join together uh, to grieve and mourn, we also unite to give thanks and to celebrate, to celebrate a life well lived, to celebrate a life committed and dedicated to public service, uh, a life which has shone uh, a light throughout the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth and around the world. And the tributes we've heard in this place today and from leaders across the globe show the respect rightly held for the late Her Majesty the Queen. May she rest in peace and God save the King. Yeah. John Cryer. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I think probably unlike every previous speaker, I only met the Queen once, and that was when she visited, appropriately enough, the Queen's Theatre in Hornchurch, which was then my constituency. And when she left, she went on, as she always did, to go from strength to strength. I left to be ejected from Parliament by the voters at the following election. So we had slightly different experiences after her uh, visit. As the, as the leader of the Liberal Democrats has said, it's difficult to imagine the world without her, and that's absolutely true. But it's worth remembering something that is very rarely remembered, and that is that in 1936, after the abdication crisis, the monarchy teetered on the brink. And according to most polls at that time, most British voters thought the monarchy might not survive for very long. Now, since 1945, the monarchy has been the most popular institution in Britain and has polled something like 80%. There's no institution that's polled anything like that level of popularity over such a sustained period of time. Now, that's not an accident. It happened for two reasons, both because the Queen and her father, George VI, had that iron dedication to public service, which possibly started in the most spectacular way when George VI decided to remain in London during the war, instead of following the advice to leave London and go elsewhere, perhaps even to Canada, as one advisor told him. That started then, but the second reason is that both George VI and Elizabeth II had an absolutely clear understanding of the constitutional parameters of the role of the monarchy, and neither of them ever strayed outside that role. And in the case of the Queen, despite repeated attempts to pull her into uh, political controversies, including the, one, the first one I can remember was in 1974, we had a hung parliament. 
and there were there was article after article in the press in those days <laughs> saying that the Queen should intervene. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Today was strange to wake up to the first day without our much-loved and hugely respected Queen Elizabeth II. There is a sense of personal loss as well as shock. Somehow her long years of service, commitment and duty felt as if they would never come to an end. As one of the older members of my family told me just this morning, things changed so much in her and our lifetime and sometimes we feel hopelessly out of date and rather uncomfortable. She was our figurehead, and for that we are truly grateful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Queen's reign was somehow timeless. Listening back this morning to her first televised Christmas broadcast in 1957, and then to her broadcast to the nation during COVID, Queen Elizabeth II proved continuity right from the post-war years through 15 different prime ministers, from Sir Winston Churchill to my right honourable friend, the member for South West Norfolk, and to the extraordinary heartwarming royal digital performances with James Bond and with Paddington Bear. For me, her handbag will now always contain a marmalade sandwich. Yes. I always remember being sworn in as a privy councillor. It was the same day as my right honourable friend, the member for Uxbridge, and we were given the uh, usual briefing on how you kneel on a footstool with your right with, with, with your right hand by your side, your left hand holding a Bible, and, uh, and my right honourable friend and I looked at each other and we were like, what? What if you fall off your footstool? And we were told, very straight-faced, don't worry, the Queen will find it very amusing. <laughs> Which we didn't find reassuring, but luckily it didn't happen. As Lord President of the Council during the hung Parliament of 2017 to 2019, I had the honour of regular audiences with the Queen ahead of Privy Council meetings. On those occasions, I was always struck by the warmth of the welcome and the frankness of the conversation. The Queen was always interested to hear updates on the progress of legislation and the mood of the House. She was very well informed and also quite challenging at a time of extraordinary events from Brexit to Donald Trump's visit to behaviour scandals here in Westminster. Once a year, the leaders of the Commons and Lords would be invited to Windsor Castle for lunch with the Queen and Prince Philip. These occasions felt quite overwhelming, but at the same time, after a pre-lunch drink in the sitting room and getting into a conversation about how well the restoration of Windsor Castle was presided over by Prince Philip compared to our own efforts to restore <laughs> the Palace of Westminster, <laughs> Baroness Evans of Bowes Park and I were very soon distracted as we sought to defend the indefensible. <laughs> a happy memory for me is going to Sandringham for Privy Council 1 January, with log fires burning and the Queen's corgis pottering around. I recall the Queen saying what a very busy Christmas she'd had, and I suggested, well, at least her family don't need to pause Christmas lunch for the Queen's speech, at which she told me they most certainly did. <laughs> As for all of us, her family would pause lunch and watch the Queen's speech, and Princess Charlotte had run over to the TV screen and said, look, there's Gangan. <laughs> very heartwarming. At each of the audiences, it would strike me anew that Privy Council meetings were just one of the many daily duties of the Queen, and that her cheerfulness and her twinkling eyes were always a constant. Truly, she was a monarch who put the comfort of others above herself, and she never faltered in her promise to spend her life devoted to service. And as we've prayed every day sitting in this place, that Queen Elizabeth I may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way, so I believe we can now pray with confidence that after this life she may attain everlasting joy and felicity 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Queen Elizabeth II spent her life building relationships in our nation, our Commonwealth and across the world. In her achievements, we can all take comfort and know that as the crown passes to our new king, we will have the example of her legacy to unite us in loyal allegiance to her successor, King Charles III. God save the king. Dame Angela Eagle. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Deputy Speaker, and it's an honour to um, pay a tribute to Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II on behalf of my constituents in Wallasey, who are in shock and mourning uh, today. Uh, one of the things that strikes uh, everyone contemplating this sad news is the sheer span of the length of time of her reign, uh, the longest ever reign in UK history. Uh, someone who lived through an era of profound upheaval and change, but who represented continuity and certainty amidst the tumult. Uh, when she was born, it's uh, hard to remember that uh, in 1926, only 10 women had ever been elected uh, into this place, into this House of Commons. Uh, and at that time, women did not exercise the vote on the same terms as men. Thankfully, that has now changed, though I always say that uh, work to achieve equality is never done. But she, uh, as the mother of the house said earlier, led just by example. She led by being. She demonstrated as our head of state, who was clearly, obviously, a woman and a wife and a mother, uh, how possible it was. Uh, even if that had been granted to her by fate, by destiny, to combine the roles of uh, the uh, pressure uh, that she had on her uh, with uh, a family life. Her coronation was the first to be televised. Uh, now the monarchy has a presence on social media platforms seen by billions. Um, her reign has seen the transition from empire to commonwealth, from conflict to peace in Northern Ireland, but also from complacency to climate emergency, which demonstrates to all of us that uh, we have much to do and many problems to confront us. The values she personified um, are clear uh, and have been clear from the comments in this House. Utter commitment to public service and duty uh, a woman who dedicated her life to the service of our nation. And when she said at 21 in a broadcast, I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service, that is a vow that she delivered, uh, as we now know, um, faithfully right up until the very end. She personified wisdom and experience, but she did, as uh, the Honourable Lady who's just uh, spoken, um, has just said, have that twinkle in her eye. Whenever uh, you were waiting in line to meet Her Majesty, you could see the twinkle and it put you at ease. She first visited Wirral in 1957, um, but during my time in this house, she first came to Birkenhead when she opened the Europa Pool in 1996, and finally uh, came to Wallasey uh, for the second time in 2011 <coughs> to uh, open the uh, newly rebuilt floral pavilion in New Brighton. Thousands upon thousands of official duties, many, many thousands of my constituents uh, looked forward uh, to, to her visits and have fond memories of them. She was always interested, always engaging, and always smiling and reassuring when she interacted uh, with people who lined the routes to see her on these fantastic occasions. Uh, so her loss will be mourned. It's a terrible but inevitable loss. She left us in a place where we know uh, we can survive the transition because of the strength she gave to the institution. So may she rest in peace, Madam Deputy Speaker. And uh, we all wish um, the greatest condolences to the royal family who are going through such terrible loss now. Uh, and we look forward uh, to supporting the new king as much as we've supported our now sadly lost Queen Elizabeth II. Yeah. 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 
It's a, it's a pleasure to follow the Right Honourable Lady. Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm filled with great sadness as I rise to pay tribute to the life and the memory of Her Late Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Our thoughts are with the Royal Family, and, uh, who have lost a mother, a grandmother, and, of course, a great-grandmother. Her Majesty lived an extraordinary life of service and the touching tributes that we have already heard from right honourable and honourable members so far, along with the outpouring of emotion from across the world, including from my own constituents in Bromsgrove District, reflect the deep affection and love in which she was held. For over seven decades, she was a source of our strength and comfort, a representative of our closest held values and beliefs, a defender of faith, and an embodiment of the very best of public service and duty. She was our North Star, a symbol of strength in difficult times. To put it simply, she was our Queen. Right Honourable and Honourable Members, uh, many have shared their, their times of when they were privileged to meet uh, Her Late Majesty. And I was able to do so on many occasions, and I always welcomed the, the huge wisdom she would share, the advice, and of course the, the good humour. I will never forget during the occasion of the final Privy Council meeting of 2017, as the formalities ended, Her Majesty suddenly said, Gin and tonic, anybody? <laughs> and proceeded to press a buzzer. And with that, her staff promptly burst through the doors of the 1844 room in Buckingham Palace, armed with trays of G&T and nibbles. Now, I'm not much of a G&T drinker myself, but I certainly was not going to turn down the opportunity of enjoying one with Her Late Majesty. I later learned that she'd like to make the last Privy Council meeting of the year extra special so that she could wish everyone a Merry Christmas. Madam Deputy Speaker, our country faces immense challenges and at home and abroad, and the person that has always been there is there no longer. However, in the wake of this terrible loss, it is an opportunity for parliamentarians from across this House to renew their commitment to the values that were embodied by Her Late Majesty – public service, duty, the national interest. If we can leave this place having achieved but the smallest fraction of what Her Late Majesty achieved, our country would be the better for it. After a lifetime of service, Her Late Majesty is now at rest. May she rest in peace, and God save the King. Yeah. 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 And on behalf of Plaid Cymru, I would like to offer my sincere sympathies and condolences to Her Majesty the Queen's children and her extended family as they come to terms with their grief. Queen Elizabeth II has been a constant presence throughout all our lives. She stood as a figure of stability in a world that is changing at a rapid and sometimes frightening pace. The loss of the continuity that Her Majesty embodied is a source of sorrow and anxiety for people across the world. Up to her final days, she conducted her duties with an extraordinary dedication that has been an inspiration for so many of us her values of duty, service, reconciliation and forgiveness are values that the people of Wales hold very dear. In Wales, we respect people who embody that sense of dedication to society and to public service, who put their public duty first. Her Majesty the Queen personified that duty for so many people for so many years. And Her Majesty had a canny ability to put people at ease in the midst of palace formality, when I was appointed, fortunate to be appointed to the Privy Council three years ago, I remember being, being nervous, being intimidated by the protocols and the rules that govern interactions with the royal family. Your mind, as it would do, tots up an infinite checklist of everything that could possibly go wrong. And what struck me was something she said. She said, you may well be worrying that you'll do something wrong or in the wrong order. Don't worry, whatever could possibly go wrong, I've seen it all before. There's nothing that you could do that would shock me now. Even among all the pomp and ceremony, there was that characteristic warmth and courtesy to the Queen. And Her Majesty was a magnificent role model for older women across the world. Historically, of course, older women have disappeared from public life. The Queen was a constant visible figure throughout the 70 years of her reign. 
From historic buildings and charities to football, she always shows an interest in Wales. People of all walks of Welsh life have been touched by the Queen's keen interest and constant support of Welsh organisations. She attended every official opening of the Senedd and showed due respect for Wales's nationhood and our growing democracy. She was patron to organisations as diverse as the Royal Welsh Agricultural Society, the Football Association of Wales, Cardiff Royal Infirmary and the Welsh Pony and Cobb Society. Her love of horses, from thoroughbreds to native ponies, shone through. You see it in those sparkling smiles. Everyone in public life knows you have a public smile. But the photos with the horses, that was her real smile. <laughs> we now see one era drawing to a close and a new one at its very best.
And as I look to the future, I have no doubt at all that the one certainty is change, and the pace of that change will only seem to increase. This is true for all of us, young and old, or amongst the more vulnerable in society who worry that they will be left behind. The sheer rate of change seems to be sweeping away so much that is familiar and comforting. But I don't think that we should be over-anxious. We can make sense of the future if we understand the lessons of the past. A new king greets his public. Moments ago, King Charles III shook the hands of supporters and mourners outside Buckingham Palace. They came to honor Queen Elizabeth II, who died yesterday at the age of 96, and show support for their new monarch. Charles ascended to the throne the moment his mother died. A series of ceremonies will mark the transition in the coming days. This is a special report from the newsroom of The Washington Post. I'm Libby Casey. Today, a speech from the new king as the United Kingdom begins its period of mourning and transition. With me today in The Washington Post newsroom, James Homan, Rhonda Colvin, and Hannah Jewell. Welcome to you all. James, let's start with you. You know, we are entering this period that's quite lengthy as the United Kingdom and really the world remember uh, Queen Elizabeth II and welcome and get used to a new king. Uh, why is there so much procedure and, and ceremony surrounding this transition? Well, for the vast majority of Britons, Libby, this is the only monarch they've ever known. Uh, more than three quarters of the British population wasn't alive uh, when Queen Elizabeth became queen. And they want to give an opportunity for everyone around the kingdom and the Commonwealth, and as you note, the world, to mourn. Uh, they, they do not want everyone uh, descending on London from Scotland and uh, Northern Ireland. And, and so you have this process playing out over the coming days uh, to continue a monarchy that has existed for a millennia where King Charles, uh, as we're now calling him, travels to go address and console his subjects uh, across the kingdom. Mm. And James, this tradition dates back uh, so, so many generations. And so uh, part of this really is uh, keeping the continuity, right? Keeping up the tradition. Talk to us about that. Yeah. And, you know, it's uh, it, it really is remarkable how similar this is to past transitions. Obviously, we're in the digital age now. Uh, when Queen Elizabeth became queen uh, after her father died, she was uh, on a, a safari looking at elephants in Kenya, didn't find out for hours uh, it took that long to get word to her. Uh, we're in a very different age uh, of social media, uh, but the traditions are still the same and they date back hundreds of years. And this is a, a, a royal family that is trying to navigate the balance of the constitutional republic, which is that they have this hereditary monarchy, but it's also a constitutional republic. And so there, there's some uh, legitimacy, but King Charles also has to earn the respect uh, of his people, and that's not necessarily a given. Hannah Jewell, how significant is this moment for the United Kingdom and its people? Well, you can see the significance playing out in ways both big and small. You know, on the big side, you have the sort of psychic national shock um, of, of this moment, of this familiar figure of 70 years, as James said, that that um, most people are under 70, at least, uh, have have only ever known um, the, the break in that continuity. And then you also have the sort of small, more banal, but still um, still sort of uh, disruptive things that, that are going to change in Britain. You know, obviously, a new monarch on the money, uh, new words in the national anthem, God save the king instead of the queen. Things like paying your taxes to His Majesty's revenue and customs instead of Her Majesty's. All, all of these sort of like little bits of daily life in Britain um, that suddenly change to have a king rather than a queen. Um, and, and this is a, already a time of sort of disruption and change in Britain. You've had upheavals to the economy. You've had a series of four prime ministers since the Brexit vote in 2016, including a brand new one, Liz Truss, just who took power just a few days ago in the last um, time that we, we saw an image of the Queen publicly um, inviting Liz Truss to form a government. Um, and you also just have this moment of significance as Britain looks forward to the future of its monarchy, um, the line of succession. Um, and again, in small ways, you see disruptions to British uh, daily life that we'll see in this this week as the nation sort of shuts down from morning, although there hasn't been an official, you know, government directive saying that things need to stop. 
you have the uh, Premier League, British uh, football, British soccer shutting down this weekend. You've had nightclubs last night saying they were shutting out of respect to the Queen. Um, and we're sure to see a lot more of this going forward in the next week or so. Mm. Rhonda Colvin, there has been international uh, outpouring of uh, respect for Queen Elizabeth. Uh, talk to us about uh, how her death is, is being met here in the United States and around the world. Yeah, of course, Queen Elizabeth's death has really resonated uh, across the globe. And here in the United States, a, a lot of elected officials, as soon as word came out, sent their recollections of her. They talked about her grace. Many also talked about the times they were able to meet her. Uh, President Biden and uh, First Lady Jill Biden also put out a very lengthy statement yesterday discussing uh, when Biden first met her uh, as a senator in the 80s. And he also met her, of course, as president as well. And uh, he discussed the impact she had. Had on, on the world and, and the United States. Uh, he also went to the uh, British Embassy yesterday, last night, to sign the condolence book. Uh, and people also gathered there in D.C. Uh, to drop off flowers. Uh, it seemed to be kind of a, a, an area where people could express their grief. Uh, and also, across the country, you saw this outpouring of reaction outside of the, the government. You saw the NFL, which had its season opener yesterday. Uh, they had a, a, a moving tribute and a, a moment of silence. Uh, you saw in New York City, where the Empire State Building, uh, the light cast on it was purple in honor of Queen Elizabeth. Uh, so it, you can see in, in all sorts of areas how many... Uh, people were touched by her life, how she was a constant in most uh, people's life throughout the world and, and also here in the United States. Washington Post senior writer Francis Steed Sellers joins me now. Um, Francis, I was watching as King Charles greeted people outside of Buckingham Palace, and you know you could hear a little bit and eavesdrop a little bit on those conversations, and people were saying things like giving their condolences and also giving him a you know a cheer up, like you can do this. I saw some old women, older women, saying, "I you know I I know you can do this," and then we heard a chorus of "God save the King" come into the background. What? are you thinking about in terms of how King Charles is processing this moment as he makes his first entrance to his subjects as king? And what a moment. He said many years ago, um, you, know, you only become king when your mother dies. So you have this immense transition to a moment of personal pain. And I think that's what you see playing out with Charles there, trying to adopt to his new role. And Charles has been heir apparent for 70 years. He was three years old when his mother became queen. So he's been waiting and trying to establish a presence without being irrelevant, without pushing too much into the party political debates or looking too involved. He's been a somewhat controversial figure in the past, a man who famously spoke to plants and uh, shook hands with his trees and cared about what's sometimes called new urbanism, but, but railed against some of the modern architecture in London. Didn't always make him popular. His marriage to Diana ended in vitriol uh, launched, uh, launched against him. And he has somehow managed to come around. Um, he's married Camilla, settled down, and all that work on the environment now looks rather um, as if he was you know, enlightened and looking ahead, ahead of his time. So what a moment for him to try and take over the mantle of his mother and greet a population that, that loved her so much. It's a challenge and one that he is clearly trying to figure out how to rise to. So, Francis, you grew up in the UK. Uh, what was it like as a Brit growing up with the Queen? Well, um, you know, I think one of the things I've heard over the last few days is I'm not a monarchist, but, or I, you know, I'm a Republican, but. Um, so many people respected her, and I think it was largely because she she didn't seem like a member of the aristocracy. She seemed very middle class in some ways. Um, she was, a, as we all know, a great lover of animals, of horses in particular, and would show up, you know, wearing sensible shoes and a tweed skirt and and uh, a headscarf at, at horsey events. Um, our Christmases were punctuated by the Queen's speech at three o'clock in the afternoon when people sort of roll over and press brandial uh, relaxation and, and then get up to listen to the Queen who would do a sort of roundup of the year. It was part of the rhythm of the year. She was very much there. Um, she adapted over the years from being, you know, that 14 year old girl who spoke on the radio to then doing these televised speeches. Her, her own coronation was, was televised. And then um, I was actually there at the Science Museum a few years ago when she posted her first tweet. So here was somebody, she wasn't, you know, posting selfies, but here was somebody who was trying to adapt and modernize and change the monarchy 
while remaining a sort of familiar and, as people have said, grandmotherly figure. Mm. Francis, I'm, I'm curious about how well people feel like they knew her. Um, because, you know, we, we do hear these moments and these recollections of her humor or a conversation she might have had, but by her very nature, by her role, she tried to sort of stay neutral on many things. And there is a little bit of uh, almost like a Rorschach test, like people could see into her what they wanted to see into her because she was able to keep sort of a placid profile in many ways, despite the world changing around her. Right. And one of these things I think Libby is sort of maintaining the magic around royalty, right? Um, there's always this balance between duty and uh, providing the, the entertainment value that, that royal families have done around, you know, across Europe. There's, you know, the, the northern ones have tended towards more, more dutiful. And the British royal family in some ways has been caught between those two modes. But she was very much somebody who linked um, the early sort of feeling of duty that came out of the Second World War um, and took us on to COVID. And I think people in, in sort of reflected on her as somebody who was a figure of stability, a figure that they could relate to, even though she was, you know, in such an extraordinary position. She was also, I think, for women, something of a feminist icon. Here was this young woman who took over after the Second World War um, with a very masculine prime minister, and she has ushered in three female prime ministers over her time. That's an extraordinary thing to recall. And also she did the last one just a few days ago. So, you know, we'll go on to have kings, King Charles, and one expects King William after that, and then King George to follow him. But we've had 70 years of a very significant female leader who really came into power at a moment when men were leading and women were playing a, a very secondary role. Mm. Well, reporter Sarah Hewson joins me now from outside of Buckingham Palace. Sarah, welcome. What's the emotion like today uh, at the palace and outside the palace? Hello to you, Libby. Well, we have seen the most extraordinary scenes here at Buckingham Palace in the last hour. King Charles III and Camilla, the Queen Consul, to arrive back from RAF Northolt, having flown back from Aberdeen in Scotland this morning. They arrived back here. They were driven to the gates of Buckingham Palace. They got out of the car and they were greeted by cheers, by uh, shouts of God save the King. And then we saw the King go on a walkabout, something that was created by his mother who recognized that she needed to be seen to be believed, that there was no point in being an absentee monarch tucked away in her palace. And we saw the king do his first walkabout as monarch. He was shaking hands with the crowds, thanking them for their support. And then he spent a long time with the crowds. He was even receiving kisses from some of those in the crowds. He looked moved. He was smiling at times. Uh, and then he was joined by his wife, now the Queen Consort, and they went to have a look at some of the many flowers that have been placed outside the gates of Buckingham Palace before the two of them walked into Buckingham Palace. And that, I thought, was a very poignant and significant image, because they have now walked into Buckingham Palace to face their destiny now as King and Queen. Sarah, what do we know about how the next days will play out? Well, as we speak, the King is inside Buckingham Palace. He's due to be meeting the Prime Minister, uh, his first audience with the new Prime Minister. He's also recording a message to the nation and the Commonwealth, taking place in the blue drawing room of Buckingham Palace. And that will be played out at 6 o'clock p.m. London time this evening. There will also be a service of thanksgiving and remembrance at St Paul's Cathedral, which will be attended by senior politicians, members of parliament. And tomorrow is, is a very symbolic and significant day because we will see the accession council. Although Charles became king at the moment that his mother died, it is formally proclaimed, is the term, tomorrow during the accession council, which takes place in St James's Palace, just a short distance uh, from here, attached, in fact, to Clarence House, which has been the king, as he was Prince Charles's home in London, his London residence. So in St James's Palace, 
this tomorrow. The Privy Council, they are the councillors uh, to the Sovereign. They will meet, they will uh, proclaim King Charles III is the new Sovereign. He will take an oath, and all of that will be televised for the first time. His mother, the Queen, was the first to have her coronation televised. Millions of people went out to buy television sets for the very first time in order to watch the spectacle. And tomorrow we will see the very first televised accession council as King Charles III is formally proclaimed as king. Mm. Uh, Francis, let's go to you for why these markers are significant and important. Because as Sarah pointed out, Charles is already king. And yet we are still going to see uh, these procedures and these ceremonies with deep history take place. Yeah, I think this is really part of maintaining what we mentioned earlier on, which is sort of the magic of the monarchy and what James talked about, that there are rituals that people have been looking forward to for a long time, even though um, the queen managed to portray herself as a very approachable person in, in many ways. She also stuck with many, many traditions and people look forward to that. I mean, there isn't, there are, there's no country probably like Britain that can do the pomp and circumstance, right? I mean, we've seen it so many times. Um, and every time there's something fresh about it, as well as um, deeply resonant of a past. And so I think this, again, is part of continuity. We've heard that Charles will shrink the monarchy. I'm sure other things will change. But maintaining some of the magic is also going to be very important if he's going to be successful as a king. Yeah, Hannah Jewell, I'm going to be curious to see how various generations uh, welcome or question that magic, right, that Francis is talking about, and, and how much the royal family is successful in this moment of connecting with all generations of, uh, of, of people in the UK and, and in the Commonwealth beyond. What will you be watching for? Well, I can't help but um, think about that word magic and what a sort of opportunity there was perhaps at the last big royal wedding um, of Harry and Meghan in 2018 and how there was so much young interest in this. Um, I, I was there on the parade route for that um, and just seeing people really of all ages who were so excited about this couple, so seeing it as so beloved and perhaps there was a missed opportunity there in their um, sort of alienation from the royal family. Um, whoever's fault that was, they'll be, you'll see, uh, hear different arguments on either side of that. But that kind of was a younger romantic face of of the royal family and, and really showed just sort of a, um, that romance, that, that, that magic, you know, everybody loves a royal wedding, people staying up really late or getting up really early here in the U.S. to, you know, see the dress, all of this stuff that was sort of harkened back to that excitement around also the, the, the wedding of William and Kate, before that of Princess Diana, such a huge global cultural moment that even though that uh, really grabbed the attention of those um, who, who, who didn't normally follow the royals that closely, you know. And, and those were those moments of magic, and it's going to be hard to see going forward. You know, there's not, you know, an imminent other wedding on the future. You have Charles, who is decidedly across age demographics less popular than his mother was. You have... Um, more sort of millennials and younger who who are who tend to question more the uh, the, the point of the legitimacy of a constitutional monarchy of a monarchy at all in um, in a democratic society in this time. Whereas you have older folks who who you know whose whole lives were were under this queen and who grew up with her, who um, who who, f who feel uh, more of that sense of necessity and, and sturdiness of the monarch that the monarchy provides. So um, I think that really going forward. Um, how I'm curious to see how will young people sort of react to Charles? Uh, a lot of mixed feelings across the board. Um, can William and Kate, who come after him, can their children, in fact, sort of resurrect that sort of intangible magic that we're talking about, from which so much of the legitimacy of the royal family derives? Hannah, when you were covering uh, the wedding of Harry and Meghan, what was your sense of uh, Britain's interest, not just in that couple and their youth and sort of the freshness they brought to the monarchy, but also just in the pomp and circumstance and the ceremony and the traditions? Because we've had a couple other markers, everything from the joy of the Jubilee this past summer to uh, the sad death of Prince Philip last year. Um, what do these sort of ceremonial moments do for people? Well, it entirely depends on your feeling about the royal family entirely. You have um, Republicans in the sense of those that, that don't believe the monarchy should continue who grumble about this disruption to daily life, although not a lot of grumbling about getting 
two extra bank holidays, that is days off work, work this summer for the uh, the Platinum Jubilee, um, which came on a like beautiful weekend um, in, in Britain where everyone got to go out, uh, whether or not they were in it for the, the official pomp and circumstance. And then you have the, the, the you know, this, this huge number of, of British people for whom uh, they really, you know, they get the commemorative stuff, their houses have pictures of the royal family, um, and who really mark these moments as, as crucial to their sort of sense of national identity. So it depends who you ask, of course, but um, as we will see this week, um, it, it's just touching everybody's lives, whether they want it to or not. Rhonda Colvin, there is an American fascination with the royals and the royal family. Uh, can we even re begin to relate to what we're, we're seeing unfold this week? Yeah, there, there has always been uh, sort of a longstanding interest in the royal family, likely because uh, Americans don't have an equivalent to it. Uh, of course, we have elected officials, presidents, but we, we don't have uh, sort of the fairy tale that a lot of Americans look at royal life to be. So that could be a reason why so many Americans watched Netflix, uh, The Crown. Uh, several seasons of that were very popular here, even though uh, many who uh, study the royal family and our insiders say that uh, those producers and those writers took some liberties uh, with the scripting um, to make it a little bit more dramatic. It's still something that a lot of Americans feel that they got to know the royal family, specifically Queen Elizabeth, uh, through. There have been, you know, a number of books, movies uh, about Queen Elizabeth that a lot of Americans have picked up. And of course, of course, when there are these royal weddings, whether it was uh, back in the 80s with uh, Charles and Diana, whether it was the most recent one that we were just talking about with Harry and Meghan, uh, Americans get up early to watch those. There, there is always this fascination surrounding the royal family. And again, it's probably because Americans don't have much to compare it to. Um, and you would, you, you would think that after uh, this mourning period is over uh, in the UK and of course globally, uh, that that might continue. I think a lot of eyes are going to be on Charles and, and how he takes this step forward. Uh, of course, eyes from the people there in Britain, but globally, a lot of people are interested uh, in how he's going to take over this new role. A lot of Americans were somewhat upset uh, when he divorced Diana and admitted to adultery. And, and of course, Diana had that famous line in, in a documentary uh, saying that there were always three of us in the marriage, and many thought that that was the third was Camilla. So that has sort of shaped Americans' view of who Charles is. That's uh, certainly, even though he has, you know, done some uh, very notable things, especially with um, uh, the environment and his passion surrounding that. Uh, he still sort of has this part of his timeline in Americans' view uh, as, as tarnished. So a lot of folks are probably going to be tuning in in the, the weeks and days and probably years ahead to see how he handles being king. Mm. James, let's talk more about that. You know, in an era when it is too easy to share your opinions in many ways, just through, you know, mm. a tweet, uh, Queen Elizabeth was able to really remain very neutral and steadfast to her, uh, what she saw as her obligation and duty uh, to the job as a royal and to sort of appeal to all people. But Charles has his passions. Is there a space for him to be able to pursue goals, passions, things he f believes in, and yet have that facade that his mother was able to maintain of sort of being one for all? It's a challenge, but it is doable. Every monarch leaves their imprint. You know, we have just finished the second Elizabethan age. Uh, it would have been uh, unimaginable 70 years ago that she would outlast her great, great grandmother, Queen Victoria, uh, to become the longest serving monarch in British history, the second longest serving sovereign in world history behind the Sun King. Uh, but Charles, as a result, and Francis was mentioning this earlier, he has been the heir to the throne for longer than anyone else in world history. And what that means is that he has had a lot of time, literally decades, to think about how he wants to approach this role of being king. And you're absolutely right, Libby, that the queen was the master at recognizing that sometimes it's better to be seen than heard, uh, but she was neither seen or perceived as conservative nor liberal, uh, as north or south. Uh, her, her mother actually came from Scottish aristocracy, uh, her father, of course, uh, from the House of Windsor. And so she was able to navigate all of that by never giving interviews, never releasing her diary or journal, 
Uh, she she really uh, had a what I think we can call an old fashioned conception of the role. And the reality is that it's now 2022, and it, it, it stands to reason that Charles will not just slim down the monarchy, but also change the job a little bit. Now, this is still someone who's 73 years old. I don't think he's going to start, you know, tweeting in the middle of the night and uh, doing reality television. Well, some 73-year-olds do. <laughs> some 73-year-olds do. Uh, but he, he will modernize the monarchy, and the question going forward will be how that goes. And to the dynamic Hannah was talking about so well, how does that play with the younger generation? Uh, you know, do people of the, the Instagram influencers or whatever is even cooler than Instagram now, I guess TikTok, do they cotton to Charles? Francis Steed Sellers, uh, you know, there was a feeling yesterday as the death of Queen Elizabeth was announced of shock, uh, even if not surprise, because she was 96 year old, six years old, but there was shock. Why, why would you think it felt like people were sort of grappling with this and wrestling with this, which, you know, she was 96 years old. Right, and she seemed as if she would go on even though people were preparing for this moment. Um, I talked to a friend yesterday who told me that her nephew um, had seen his mother grow tearful, and, and the mother had said, you know, I, 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 um, I don't quite know why I'm so moved by this. And, and the young man said, um, well, she was family. And I don't quite know how she managed to do that, but she did infiltrate people's lives um, with this very sort of grandmotherly approach. Whether Charles can do that is very much harder to say, but I will say that I think Charles is actually somewhat fortunate in the moment because his passions, and we'll set aside um, fox hunting, but his passions for gardening, for organic food, for architecture that makes sense and is run on, a, on the size of people rather than cars, all of that is having its moment. So Charles, you know, who knows how long he will reign, but he comes onto the throne at a moment where his passions are actually passions that many other people have learned to share recently. Um, let's go to Sarah Hewson, who joins me now from outside of Buckingham Palace. Sarah, what do we know about how the Queen's last few hours played out? Well, Libby, we know that early yesterday morning, the Prince of Wales travelled from Dumfries House in Ayrshire in Scotland. The he Royal Helicopter was dispatched to collect him in the early yesterday morning after 6 a.m. and to take him to the Balmoral Estate. And he was photographed there looking very sombre indeed as he set off to go and see his mother for what would be the last time. Princess Anne was at the Balmoral Estate. She was in Scotland. She'd been conducting engagements there, so she was with her mother in her final hours. But it, we have learned that, in fact, the other members of the royal family, Prince William, Prince Andrew, the Duke of York, the Earl of Wessex and the Countess of Wessex, who flew up together on an RAF plane to Aberdeen, didn't actually make it in time. Prince Harry was on a separate flight. He, too, didn't make it in time to say goodbye to his grandmother. But they have then spent the night at Balmoral. Prince Harry left the, uh, early this morning. He's returned to Windsor. Uh, Prince William, who is now the Duke of Cornwall and Cambridge, he has also returned to Windsor to be with his family. He will be back here tomorrow in London for the Accession Council. And uh, we then saw the King and Queen Consort returning back to London and into Buckingham Palace. So the Queen had her two eldest children with her in her final moments. And I think what is particularly special is that those final moments were in Balmoral, which is a place that has meant so much to her. It is actually where she and Prince Philip got engaged, and it is a place that, for them, was incredibly special, a haven, and somewhere that they were both at their happiest. And I think we've been talking a lot in the last 24 hours about the, the planning of the funeral, how every detail had been planned. We, you can't plan the manner of your death. But if you could, I think for the Queen, this would have been exactly what she would have chosen because she was at home with her family, somewhere that was very, very special to her. Having had a summer in Balmoral, in the Scottish Highlands, visited by family members, by friends, out picnicking with her dogs, it's somewhere very special, and for those to have been her final weeks, I think, is of great comfort to members of the family and to the nation as well. 
Francis, you know, there is this privacy and this personal experience of a, a great grandmother and the loss of a, a mother, a grandmother, and a great grandmother. And then there's the very public reality of so many people wanting to know more details and wanting in. Can you talk to us about that dynamic that the royal family is both privileged to and also really prisoner of? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one wonders, we talked earlier about um, Meghan and Harry, and Harry, of course, made this point very, very clearly, and may in some ways have done his uh, father and brother a favor, although it didn't seem so at the time, in emphasizing that they were trapped in something that was going to be dutiful, that their lives were going to be absorbed by duty, um, and that he was he was leaving it. Um, so there is this tension, this tension between a public life and a private life, and the private life is clearly very privileged. But, you know, the Queen, most people saw the Queen cutting ribbons, uh, opening hos uh, hospitals, um, doing dreary factory tours, and being very interested in the individuals she met. She was able to convey, and I think probably truly did enjoy meeting people. She was able to convey that interest. And that allowed people to feel that they got to know her a little bit. I mean, you hear often of people who had a few words with her and she'd have a quick turn of phrase or a joke that gave that sense of intimacy. And then they gave her in return some privacy. So there's the balance. Can that continue? It'll be up to Charles to find out whether he can navigate as successfully as his mother did. Francis, final thoughts from you before we let you go this morning. What's on your mind? Well, I've been struck, I have to say, and I'm always struck by how fascinated Americans remain with the royal family. It's extraordinary. And I do think it has to do with the pomp surrounding them, but also, um, you know, their travels around the world, their um, continued efforts to try to maintain um, a, a relevance in today's world. I'm going to be fascinated to see how the pomp is received in the coming weeks. Um, and also looking very closely at the younger generation and how they respond to this change. Um, I have many friends who believe it's time for more change than just a change from one uh, member of the royal family to the next one. And we'll see how they respond in coming days. But it's going to be a time of immense um, interest and, again, an opportunity for Britain to show off its, its pomp and circumstance. Francis Steed Sellers, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, please do stay with us, everyone else, because we are watching today what happens uh, in that building right there, Buckingham Palace in London. We do anticipate hearing from King Charles III in a little while. Sarah Hewson, talk to us about the speech uh, that King Charles will be giving today. It will be pre recorded. Um, what is the significance of this moment in these days of mourning and transition? This is a hugely significant speech, Libby. This is one that will go down in the history books. And this is a speech that King Charles III will have been working on for many years, and particularly in the latter months, as it became apparent that the Queen's health was failing, he will have been thinking very much about what it is he wants to say about the kind of king he is going to be. It is also a chance for him to pay his respects to his mother. We saw him put out a written statement last night talking about his beloved mother, how cherished she was by both the family and the nation and around the world. And he will try to bring the nation together, and I think that is what people will be looking out for. At a time of huge change, at a momentous time like this, the words that he chooses to bring people together. When we think about the speech that the Queen made, the address the Queen made during the coronavirus pandemic, when people were really frightened and really uneasy about what was coming, and the Queen's words were so perfectly chosen when she said, we will meet again. And I think we will be looking out for that degree of comfort, bringing the nation together, that unifying sense from the new monarch this evening. Sarah, so much is going into this, I would imagine, from everything from what he wears, how he sits or stands, uh, just the, the presentation of it and the symbolism of it, as well as the words. I mean, how much pressure is on him in this moment? I've heard one report, and I, I haven't had it confirmed, Bibby, that he will be sitting at his late father's desk. And every single minute detail like that will have been thought out, the photographs that are in the background. Whenever the Queen did her Christmas message, everything was scrutinized like that, and that will all have been planned. And it will have been
been planned for a long time. These plans, Operation London Bridge, as it's called, have been carefully choreographed and refined over many, many years now. The King inside Buckingham Palace has several duties this afternoon before we see that uh, address to the nation. He'll be meeting the Prime Minister. He also has a meeting with the Earl Marshal, that is the Duke of Norfolk, and that is the person who at this point has one of the most important roles because it is his role to oversee the planning for the funeral and just imagine quite how enormous that task is, planning a state funeral. We have not seen this since the death of the Queen's father, the King. Sarah Hewson is live for us outside of Buckingham Palace and uh, that speech by King Charles III, 6 p.m. Uh, local time where she is there in London, 1 p.m. Eastern time where I am here uh, with James Homan and also Rhonda Colvin and Hannah Jewell. James, uh, let's talk about uh, the expectations and the need for Prince Charles to weigh his words carefully this evening. Yeah, it's a delicate needle to thread, uh, obviously one he's given a lot of thought to. Uh, and it is interesting that it's a, a pre-taped speech uh, not being delivered live. It's uh, part of an effort, I think, to make sure that you know everything is just so. As Sarah was just saying, thought was given to what desk he's sitting in, what room he's sitting in. Uh, he needs to both console and to reflect on his mother's legacy. This is both a personal and a national loss. Yet he also needs to look forward, and it, it's it's hard to get that balance just right. Uh, this is also a tough time in the United Kingdom. Uh, their inflation is twice as bad as it is here in the United States. Uh, they are facing a very severe energy crisis this winter. Uh, housing affordability is an even bigger problem than it is in the United States, and you know he is a, a politically neutral figure. But there is uh, some urgency in this speech to convey that he feels the pain of, of everyday Brits uh, and that he is, is mindful of their plight. Mm. Um, Hannah, as we heard from Sarah Hewson, one of the things that King Charles will be doing is uh, meeting with the new prime minister, also brand new in her post. Talk to us about that relationship. and. Um, and before you even talk about what will happen, just put this in context for us, both of them brand new in their roles. I think it's going to be um, like you know starting a new job on the same day as somebody else. You have a certain camaraderie when that happens, right? But um, basically, these are these weekly meetings that these two will have, the new monarch, the new prime minister. Private meetings, they're called private audiences, as the queen did for 70 years with her you know, parade of 15 prime ministers over that time. Um, and something I'm really interested in, and again, these are private meetings. We, we, we can't necessarily know how things will happen. But there's this interesting contrast um, in, in the interests and the, perhaps the politics of, of these two figures. You know, Charles officially apolitical, but has shown a lot of interest over the years in climate, in the environment, um, in uh, conserving nature, as you know, often seen on TV doing nature programs and, and supports charities that work in this space. Not to say that he is, you know, the most radical green activist in the world. Um, he approaches these things um, about preserving the land, uh, um, but also has been seen at um, climate conferences. He gave a big speech at COP26 last year at the, climate, the Global Climate Conference in Glasgow. This is clearly an issue that's dear to his heart, whether or not you consider that a political one, which is another, um, another discussion, whereas Liz Truss has just this week um, uh, in her one of her first moves trying to address this energy crisis um, is is actually a very unpopular one in the UK and one with questionable benefits is that she's lifted a ban on fracking on the land in Britain. Um, she has also um, increased oil drilling, uh, is, is really taking that sort of a stance as a way that she plans to address uh, the energy crisis. She's also just appointed um, a minister overseeing environmental issues called uh, Matthew Sinclair, who, who, who wrote a book that sort of had moments of suggesting that, you know, the, the warming world could have certain benefits. Um, and, and sort of tackled what he called a burgeoning climate change industry and sort of being a, a critique of, of the, 
believers of climate change, basically. So, so this is uh, these are quite sort of um, you know you, you see these sort of politics happening on the right in in the U.S., but I'd say it's more unusual to say people take taking that sort of stance on on climate change, um, of, over which there is less questioning among public figures normally of whether it exists at all. Um, and, and, I, and I really wonder and would love to be a fly on the wall in, in those conversations um, between the new king and the new prime minister. Hannah, how much is on pause uh, in the United Kingdom during this week? And, you know, the world doesn't stop. I mean, everything may stop in one sense of this period of mourning and transition, but politics still continues. Uh, inflation still continues. Wars still continue. And so what else will be happening uh, in parallel to all of these ceremonies we'll be witnessing over the next 10 days? Well, I think this is such an interesting contrast to the to the U.S., where I think even if there were, you know, a huge state funeral of a huge figure, an ex-president or or, or, or or something like that, um, I don't think you would see, you know, nightclubs shut that night as they did last night in Britain. I don't think you would see um, a lot of, like, sports programming going off air necessarily. I think there'd be a lot of commemoration, obviously. You'd have all these official events. Whereas in Britain, there's there's just a lot more shutting down, including uh, media coverage and just what's on TV, and sort of replacing comedy programs with with more commemorations of the Queen. These packages that these media organizations would have been preparing for honestly probably decades um, to to have them ready to go. Um, and so I think that like the the life goes on in some senses that you have a new government that is that is, is, is supposed to be sort of tackling this, um, this series of crises that we've been talking about in Britain. Will those take a back step? I saw some anger online yesterday um, that there was a, a, a British reporter um, on, on one of the networks who was saying, well, like, you know, the energy, people won't be thinking about the energy crisis anymore. And, and people were saying, well, of course they will. This is, um, this is a real threat to human life. Uh, there is the possibility of, you know, power cuts, turning off the heat and so on in the middle of winter in Britain. Um, and so that work is still going on, the, but the focus on it may be shifted for some time um, as the new government attempts to try and tackle these issues. James, let's talk more about that dynamic, uh, potentially, with the new prime minister and King Charles. Yeah, it, it's really fascinating. Uh, when Queen Elizabeth was coronated, she was 26 years old. And the prime minister at the time, the first of 15 uh, during her reign, was Winston Churchill. Uh, who had already you know, won World War II. He was 79 years old at the time. He was born in 1874. Today, as uh, King Charles has his first audience with Prime Minister Truss, Charles is 73, Prime Minister Truss is 47. Uh, at one point, Charles was giving a speech a few years ago and he talked about his mother's own evolution from being sort of a, a young woman uh, with her first prime minister to really having the confidence and the perspective that came from longevity in later relationships. One of the things that's going to be really interesting to watch is what the relationship is like between Truss and Charles. Two dynamics to watch. The first is that Truss, uh, when she was an undergraduate at Oxford, was a Republican, uh, which in the British context means that she was anti monarch. She said that the, that era should end. She since renounced that, said it was, she called it a youthful indiscretion. Uh, the second thing is that she's a Thatcherite. Uh, she says that Margaret Thatcher is her political hero. She dresses like Margaret Thatcher. It sometimes seems to have an affect uh, to talk like Thatcher. And Thatcher had an icy relationship with Queen Elizabeth. Uh, their weekly sessions on Tuesdays were quite icy, very formal, rigid. Uh, uh, you, It'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, how warm Truss is. They're both new to this, and uh, and so maybe that will give them some commonality, especially with the hard times that are currently facing the British. You know, Rhonda, one of the fascinating aspects of this, as Hannah and James have talked about, is that Charles is in his 70s, and so he may already have relationships with other world leaders, you know, sort of done the social mingling on the, the sort of the, the, the scene of fundraising, donors, working on the causes he's passionate about. What will you be watching for the relationships he has with, with world leaders or with people here in the United States? 
Yeah, that's going to be really something fascinating to keep an eye out on. Uh, Queen Elizabeth, of course, because her reign was so extensive, uh, she is known throughout history and, and the people she met, whether it's U.S. presidents, leaders from other countries, um, and she sort of uh, certainly made her impact on that front, the global front. But it, is, it does remain to be seen how Charles is going to handle global relationships. Of course, as a royal, uh, he has uh, been a part of tours across across the, the world. Um, he's been here uh, and has met with uh, our presidents before. Um, so it is going to be interesting to see how he handles that part of the job, which is to, you know, extend uh, the diplomacy from uh, Britain to the rest of the world and be that face, which she did a very good job at. Uh, so that's certainly a part of the role that I think everyone's going to want to watch. Of course, we've talked about his initiatives with climate and the environment and how he has been on the world stage promoting those issues. Um, but we haven't really seen him in the capacity yet. Uh, like she was in working with global leaders. Well, our colleague, Washington Post reporter Lee Powell, spoke with mourners this morning outside of Buckingham Palace. Let's listen. What I'd like people to know is what a supreme leader she was, an absolute lady. You know, someone who stood the test of time, as I said, who led the way, our constant. She's all I've ever known in my lifetime. I was here at um, the Jubilee celebrations recently in her platinum, you know, and um, when I heard the news, I was absolutely devastated, heartbroken, and it's just paying my respects to come today and just to feel closer to her. It's my way of feeling closer to her. And just a little bunch of roses to say thank you, ma'am, for your service. Tape from outside of Buckingham Palace this morning, collected by our colleague Lee Powell. Uh, Sarah Hewson, tell us more about how people are paying their respects today. I think, Libby, that King Charles will have been greatly comforted and, and perhaps even surprised by the size and the warmth of the welcome that he received when he arrived back here at Buckingham Palace. He undertook his first walkabout as king, and he spent a long time talking to the crowds, uh, shaking hands, receiving kisses. There were shouts of, God save the king. It's quite hard to, to, to even say that. We have got so used to the national anthem, God save the queen, which will now change. So many things will change. Uh, there were shouts of, we love you, Charles. His wife, Camilla, now the queen consort, looked, I have to say, broken. Um, she was extremely emotional. She stood to one side as he was conducting that walkabout, and then they were reunited to look at the flowers. She managed a couple of waves to the crowd, um, but she did look extremely emotional and upset. And I think that what we're seeing here is, is two things playing out. This is a family grieving. This is a son grieving for his beloved mother, while also having to rise to the occasion and fulfill the duty that he has known was coming and he has prepared for for so long, but for which I don't think anything could have prepared him for the magnitude and the emotion that he would feel on a day like today and yesterday. Sarah, it, it was such a contrast of people giving him condolences for the loss of his mother and then also support for the new title and job that he holds. And as you said, there were a couple choruses of God Save the King, and there were some people in the crowd saying, like, I know you can do this, and, and wishing him, him luck. Um, tell us more about how Charles and Camilla now navigate these next days and weeks as a couple. Well, well, it's interesting you talk about that reception, Libby, because it's not so many years ago that that kind of reception for this couple would have been unimaginable. Even at the time of their wedding back in 2005, there was real disquiet about what Camilla would be called. And the Queen made sure, with her eye on the succession and the smooth transition, that she made it clear before the end that she very much wanted Camilla to be known as Queen Consort. And there has been a rehabilitation in public minds of the 
now king, the, formerly the Prince of Wales, and formerly the Duchess of Cornwall, because somehow we have come to see, in this country at least, that they are a good force to be reckoned with. They're a good team. He needs that support. The Queen always talked about the Duke of Edinburgh being her strength and stay, and that she couldn't have done that job without him. And boy, will Charles need that support from Camilla now as he enters this next chapter. And Camilla herself, it was recently her 75th birthday here in the UK. She was on the front cover of magazines. She took part in a documentary. We have seen much more of her, and the public attitudes to her, some of which were very hostile, have softened. And I think also Charles's image has softened. At the Platinum Jubilee, some of the, the, the most favourite images from uh, the pageant uh, were of little Prince Louis, his grandson, messing about and, and, and playing and being mischievous and cheeky, and then wanting to go over and sit on his grandpapa's lap. And Prince Charles sitting there as a grandfather was a very strong image as well, all part of that rehabilitation of his public image, leading up to where we are now. Sarah, Camilla is queen consort, and, and so, as you mentioned, the, the queen, Queen Elizabeth, had, had said she wanted that title for Camilla. But So let's talk about the significance of that language, because should... King Charles die, Camilla does not become queen, right? The line of succession then goes to, to William. So talk to us about this title, Queen Consort, and the significance of it. Yeah, and, and at the time of their wedding, actually, the briefing was that perhaps she would be known as Princess Consort still, because the public couldn't countenance the idea of, of Camilla being called Queen, but she now is Queen Consort. So that means she is not the monarch, but she is the partner of the monarch. And yes, the title, the King, will pass down to now the direct heir to the throne, Prince William. His title has changed as well. He was the Duke of Cambridge. He is now the Duke of Cornwall and Cambridge. He will become the Prince of Wales, and Catherine, Kate, will become the Princess of Wales. But it doesn't happen automatically. That title is not passed automatically. It is granted by the King after his accession. So they will become the Prince and Princess of Wales. And I think for them as well, for William, this is a huge moment. We've already seen him over recent months taking a much more prominent role. He accompanied his father to the state opening of Parliament, for example. He's been very much at the heart of family decisions surrounding his brother, Prince Harry, surrounding the Duke of York, where the Prince of Wales has had a very long apprenticeship. We are now seeing Prince William's apprenticeship playing out, because he won't have as long to wait as his father did. Uh, his father taking to the throne at the age of 73, when many are contemplating retirement. A very long apprenticeship indeed, Sarah. Um, Rhonda Colvin, let's go to you for more on Camilla, and who will now be known, is known as Queen Consort Camilla, and just who she is, Rhonda. Yeah, well, Sarah just gave us a great rundown and, and some background on Camilla. Uh, but she and Charles met in the 70s, before both of them were married to other people. And of course, there was the famous divorce with Diana in uh, 95. Um, but Camilla and Charles married in 2005. And of course, because everyone remembers Diana and, and she's sort of frozen in time as, you know, a, a beautiful woman in her 30s, uh, Camilla's uh, her presence on the royal stage is something that I know a lot of Americans have questioned because of those allegations that she was sort of this other woman in that marriage. Um, but it's, it's going to be interesting to watch her take on her new role as queen consort. She, uh, of course, like other royal uh, family members, she has patronages and she's president over uh, uh, many charities, actually 90, according to the couple's website. Uh, and she focuses on issues like animal welfare, domestic abuse, uh, support for rape victims. So uh, those are, are certainly really uh, weighty topics that uh, extend to the, the entire globe and are of interest to the entire globe. So it's going to be interesting to see how, uh, what her persona becomes as now she's taking this role as queen consort. Uh, is she going to be able to sort of 
change uh, the image that so many people might have of her. Um, and because Diana was so liked, uh, it's, it's just going to be so interesting to see how people adapt to seeing uh, this new queen consort. Mm. Uh, Hannah, you know, there is this utility in that role, as, as we've heard our other guests talk about, in the sense that the queen consort is there to support the king, right? Much as we know Queen Elizabeth relied on her husband, uh, Philip. So what will you be watching for Camilla to be doing over the coming days here during these ceremonies where her husband takes such a prominent role uh, in, in, in leadership? Well, it just really can't be overstated how much the times have changed when it comes to public and the media's perspe per, um, perspective and, and perception of Camilla. Um, she has been ever present, as Rhonda said, in the sort of royal narrative since, uh, well, for decades from they, since they met in the 70s, particularly she was so uh, caught up in one of the worst years for the Queen, personally, and her 40th anniversary, um, 1992, her 40th anniversary on the throne, um, she famously referred to her Annus Horribilis, I think I've said that right, not a, not a classic scholar, but um, this is how uh, the Queen referred to that year, 1992, when Diana and Charles were really at war in the public eye. Uh, the Duke and Duchess of York, her, Prince Andrew, that is, they separated um, from his wife. Princess Anne also divorced. So this is like trouble in, in, in three of the, her children's marriages all at the same time. And actually, Windsor Castle also literally caught fire that year. Um, and so it was kind of an interesting speech and tone, um, what, which is unusual, in which the Queen sort of, you know, didn't didn't hash out the drama in public, but sort of asked for better treatment from the press and the public. And I think that uh, it, it's sort of hard. Maybe did she imagine at that 40th anniversary how much more positively people would feel about her and about Charles and Camilla also um, 30 years later? And so I'm so interested to see how the press will cover um, Camilla, the same you know tabloids in Britain that really dragged her over the coals and, and, and the whole lot of them not that long ago. Well, not that long ago, but uh, in 1992, that bad year for the Queen. It feels not that long ago to me, Hannah. <laughs> someone who was alive and functioning in the 90s. Um, you know, so that's Latin for horrible year. And it really is a marker that the queen herself said and acknowledged was an incredibly difficult time period for her. Her relationship with Camilla evolved over the years, Hannah. Well, yes, this, there was all of these sort of machinations over what sort of a, a title should she have, um, and, and not being until now that Charles as king can make her the queen consort officially, because it just seemed so perhaps shocking at the time that that this figure of, of who associated with adultery and and sort of shame on the royal family and and, and public uh, uh, distaste and anger in this moment, especially compared to the popularity of Diana, that Camilla should someday be a queen of any kind, not a reigning queen, but um, uh, not a sovereign, but a queen consort. Uh, it, it sort of shows how you, you saw over the years how Camilla would sort of turn up at more events, how they were, you know, allowed to marry in the sort of, uh, the, the phrases you say about the royal family that sort of boggle the mind for normal people, whether you're allowed to marry someone or not based on their, their status and so on, feelings about divorce. These issues that have just like been with the royal family for for, you know, since royal families have existed anywhere in the world, uh, these dramas related to, to marriage and so on. But, but, but nevertheless, you see, um, you see how she had taken more of a public role. People had sort of, like, come around to Camilla, I guess. And so very curious to see how she, what she, what she does, where she appears in the coming days. Yeah. Um, James Homan, for people of a certain generation, uh, you know, Princess Diana really was the symbol of hope, youth, energy, coming into the monarchy. And then, of course, uh, you know, the, the separation that she had from Charles, as well as from that lifestyle, w was so remarkable in, at the time. And then her death was so tragic, uh, now 25 years ago. It, it, the anniversary was, was pretty recently, Libby. And uh, Hannah's absolutely right that 1992 was a, a terrible year for the queen. But, you know, 1996, 1997 was really, in a lot of ways, the low point. Uh, and the, the Charles and Diana separated uh, in that period of 92, 93, and then they ended up getting divorced officially at the Queen's insistence in 1996. And then a year later, uh, Princess Diana was with her boyfriend and they were being chased by paparazzi, terrible car accident. She died, and the Queen's initial response really uh, outraged a lot of Brits uh, who did 
really cotton to Diana, who did feel that she was the future of the monarchy, uh, that uh, you know, they identified with her a lot more than they identified certainly with Charles. And initially, you know, we can see uh, on the screen right there, uh, Buckingham Palace, uh, they, uh, the queen wouldn't lower the flag to half staff because typically the flag is only raised there when the queen is present. And, uh, and so she wanted to follow tradition and there was outrage that the, the queen refused to sort of acknowledge Diana's death. Uh, and the queen bowed to public pressure. Uh, it took about 24 to 36 hours, but the queen uh, did actually lower the flag. And then the queen did give a public speech. She didn't want to lionize Diana, uh, but uh, she, she did uh, basically express sympathy and say that anyone who ever knew Diana will never forget her. Tony Blair, who was the British prime minister at the time, writes about this in his memoir uh, quite compellingly and says it really was this moment of crisis for the crown. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's amazing because you're right, Libby, it has been 25 years uh, and, and there really has been a dramatic change. I think we saw it in 2012 during the, uh, the, the Diamond Jubilee uh, when the, the British really had fully come around uh, on the Queen, the, the shadow of Diana uh, was, was not quite as, as long as it was uh, really through the 90s. Mm. Hannah, let's talk more about that. I mean, the, those moments were uh, captured in the film The Queen. Of course, this was sort of a, a, a biopic. It's loosely based on on the events of that of that time. But even some of the footage in movies like that showed the real outpouring of grief and almost hysteria uh, by the British people, just this incredible sense of tragic loss as Diana died, and then contrasting that with the goal of the royal family of keeping a lot of their personal grief private and then trying to show that stiff upper lip to the public. There was criticism um, of the Queen for not, you know, showing enough emotion um, at Diana's funeral, moments like this compared to other times in, in, in her reign. Um, and, and it just really, that whole time, showed the sort of radical popularity of Princess Diana. And it's funny to think now, Prince Diana is one of the most sort of thought, remembered as a quintessential royal, one of the most famous royals, and certainly beloved royals, but was really uh, seen as this sort of renegade who had to be reined in by, you know, the firm, by the royal family at the time. Things like, um, uh, you know, taking on uh, AIDS as a cause in the 1980s, in 1987, at a time before that was, anyone was touching that politically elsewhere. Uh, visiting an AIDS ward in 1989. I just want to say, I just want to, sorry, I, my mic was on. I just wanted to say, not only touching the issue politically, but touching literally people yeah. who had AIDS. Like Shaking showing hands, that she was yeah. not afraid of children. Uh, who were suffering from HIV and AIDS and, and literally putting her body out there to show that there shouldn't be a stigma attached to it. And just what a huge moment and how, what a, what a sort of, there's only so many moments that a, a royal can do something sort of radical, but that was certainly one of them at the time and sort of helping to destigmatize AIDS for that reason. And, and all of this sort of work um, adding up to, to just her enormous popularity among those who even did not like the royal family. And so this is, this is the uh, the contrast um, with himself, with Charles having you know betrayed someone who did this kind of work is 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 lingering in the background of his legacy moving forward. Um, but I think that uh, those moments in royal history are just so fundamental to his legacy today. I think. Mm. Um, Hannah, let's talk more about what's expected of, of Charles and Camilla over the coming days here, and and what Camilla will need to be doing behind the scenes here to help her husband. Gosh, well, you just can't know uh, the, the into anyone's private lives as much as we would love to. Um, but I think, again, as Charles has been preparing for this moment for so, so very long, um, so too has Camilla, and she will be striking this balance between um, being present, being showing her support without, you know, being at the forefront. This is not necessarily about her this week, um, but being that emotional support behind the scenes, um, as well as beginning to assert her presence at these public functions um, as a queen course, consort, someone who never uh, necessarily um, was expected to have that title until more recently. Hmm. So, James, let's talk more about this idea of duty and responsibility that Queen Elizabeth was so famous for and what now passes on in terms of responsibility to her son. 
Yeah, Louis, you know, it's it, for those of us who are uh, mere mortals, uh, <laughs> uh, the idea of being royal sounds like it could be pretty fun. Uh, you get to, you know, live a life of leisure. Uh, but it's obviously been quite stifling for a lot of people who have been in the royal family. Uh, when, when you think about uh, Queen Elizabeth, her uncle renounced the throne so that he could marry a twice divorced woman from Baltimore, Wallace Simpson. Uh, he couldn't handle the, the pressure. Uh, and then the Queen's own uh, grandson, Harry, uh, basically defected from the monarchy. He's still officially in the line of succession, but really just couldn't handle the pressure, especially uh, with his wife, Meghan Markle, uh, who is half African American and uh, just was savaged by the British tabloids and press. And uh, both have been pretty open about their struggles with mental illness. And they moved to California uh, and, and gave up their official royal duties. The reason I tell those two stories is it's an illustration of how it actually is a, you know, heavy as the head that wears the crown. It's quite a burden when you think about the duties of being royalty. You can't say what you think all the time. You can't go uh, travel freely. Uh, you know, you get the, the crown jewels, but you, know, you, you, you can't have regular friends. Uh, you are constantly in the tabloid spotlight. Uh, you, know, you aren't allowed to weigh in on politics uh, constitutionally, <laughs> thanks to the Magna Carta. So the, the, there is this pressure of, to be dutiful and the queen embodied that, and it is what gave the monarch so much stability through really a period of a lot of instability. You think about the last 70 years, uh, decolonization, uh, globalization, the uh, rise of technology, the internet, the television barely existed uh, when the queen was a child. And, and so the, the queen's sense of duty helped sustain the monarchy, but now uh, I think Charles shares a lot of that same sense of duty. He bristled. Uh, with it as a younger man. Uh, I think that that was a lot of his, you know, his youthful rebellion, feeling like he had gotten pressured by the family into marrying Diana. Uh, and uh, in some ways it was rebellion that, uh, the, the infidelity, uh, not to excuse that in any way. Uh, but the, I think he's grown into this place as the world's longest uh, king in waiting where he gets that sense of duty. Now the, the question is what about the grandkids of the queen? Uh, you know, Harry has kind of gone to California. William, I think, also has grown into the role. He found a princess in Kate who appreciates the, the, the role of duty, who uh, did get along well with the queen. And, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons people feel like the monarchy has a future is because William does seem quite uh, ready, uh, not reticent, to, to grow into this role. Sarah Hewson, tell us more about the role of William and, and also the role of Harry at this moment. Yes, well, Prince William now becomes a direct heir to the throne. He becomes the Duke of Cornwall as well as the Duke of Cambridge, and he will become the Prince of Wales. And he plays a vital role. And I think the way we saw the transition starting to shape itself over recent months while the Queen's health was fading gave us a, a suggestion of what it was going to be like. And I think we will see a very prominent role for Prince William, that he will be there front and centre with his father, as he was at the state opening of Parliament, which was a hugely significant occasion for him to take on, uh, the Queen giving her son and grandson special powers in order to represent her at such a constitutionally important occasion. And I think that for Prince William, this is a moment where we will see him stepping up in a big way. And his father will rely on him to do so and to support him. Prince Charles wants to have a slimmed down monarchy, and that has almost happened by default because of the departure of Prince Harry and Meghan, and also the Duke of York from public life. And so the role of William and Kate 
is going to be even more important. And as for Harry, I think the hope always was that he would be there to support his brother. No one else knew what it was like to grow up in the way that they did, and that William would need to rely on him when his turn came. We will have to wait and see whether there is able to be any reconciliation and whether, in fact, a huge moment like this does bring the family back together. Sarah, we just saw uh, the Prime Minister Liz Truss leaving 10 Downing Street to head to meet with King Charles. Tell us about what we know of their meeting and what to expect. Libby, it's really remarkable. I was at Balmoral on Tuesday this week, just three short days ago, when Liz Truss was invited to form a government by the Queen, the Queen's 15th Prime Minister. It was her first audience with the Queen, and I said then that she would have to get used to this because she would be having a weekly audience with the Queen. No one could have predicted at that point that just less than 48 hours later, the Queen would be dead. So in the space of a week, we have a new Prime Minister and we have a new monarch. So we have the King and the new Prime Minister who will be shaping this together, I suppose. It is a huge moment for Liz Truss as Prime Minister. Yesterday in the House of Commons, she was delivering her energy bill, a really important piece of legislation in the middle of a cost of living crisis with energy bills soaring here in the UK as they are around the world. And a note was passed to her. And you could see the look on her face that this was serious. And in the first proper day in the job, there she had to be, standing outside Downing Street, standing at Downing Street, giving a speech on the death of the monarch. It is really quite a remarkable turn of events that has happened this week. And we'll have an audience now, they'll have a meeting, and there'll be many more meetings over the coming days as the final plans for the funeral are put into action. Sarah, how important is that relationship? I mean, we know that they have traditionally these weekly meetings, and, and, and we've heard talk about the relationship that Queen Elizabeth was able to forge, some closer with some prime ministers than others. But how meaningful is that pause in the weekly routine and that, and that temperature check between those two leaders uh, on a regular basis? Is this an opportunity? Well, past Prime Ministers have talked about how crucial and how important that weekly audience with the monarch is to them, because it is the one time where the head of the state and the head of government come together and discuss the politics of the day, what is happening in government. And the Queen was always there as wise counsel. She had seen so much. She had such wisdom that she could impart. She also, was also a great listener. And Prime Ministers found her to be hugely important uh, as an ear, and also an ear that they could trust. And we heard from Theresa May, the previous Prime Minister, speaking in the House of Commons earlier, uh, where members of Parliament were giving tributes to Her Majesty the Queen. And, and she got a laugh because she said that this was the only meeting where she could guarantee that it wouldn't have got leaked to the media. And that was really important, that is really important for Prime Ministers, to know that they can walk into that room at Buckingham Palace, and latterly it's been done virtually, and they can share what is going on, they can share their concerns, and they have wise counsel in the form of the monarch. You know, Rhonda Colvin, it's sort of hard to even imagine anything like that uh, in, in our parallel. Uh, you know, having some sort of an advisor or counsel or even just a listening ear um, can you talk about that? Yeah, we really don't have much to compare here in the U.S., uh, the relationship between a monarch and a prime minister or the constitutional duties of a monarchy. Uh, of course, we, we run on an elected system, but that's one of the things that I know I have read about the presidents, the U.S. presidents who have met uh, Queen Elizabeth. One of the things that impressed upon them is that she was this woman, and the monarchy as well, is above politics. They don't have to, every few years, craft messages to get votes. 
it's a consistency that just doesn't exist uh, here with our politics. And I think uh, the timing, of course, of Queen Elizabeth's death is pretty poignant when you look and uh, at the time we're living in right now in U.S. politics with so much divisiveness uh, that you do have this symbol of continuity who uh, went through history meeting with so many uh, political figures, uh, world leaders who she may not have agreed with uh, on a personal basis, but she lived out that duty and that sense of service because she felt that that was her job and she was going to see it all the way through. So yeah, you're right. We don't have much to compare it to the two systems, but it is sort of a, a hopeful beacon to look at when you, you do consider all of those positive sides of monarchy. So James Homan, let's talk about uh, what is expected in terms of Charles as a leader uh, versus the role of a prime minister. I mean, I mean, it may seem like a bit of an obvious difference, right? The king versus prime minister. But where did the boundaries of Charles's power begin and end? Yeah, to, to answer that question, let me just jump on to what Rhonda just said, which is, uh, you know, this idea that we don't have this dual hat system here. And as a result of that, I think for Americans, we expect our presidents to play the role uh, that both the queen or king plays and that the prime minister plays. Uh, in, in the British system, they do not erect the kinds of cults of personality around their prime ministers that we erect around our presidents. You, know, you think back uh, just two days ago uh, when we were doing the Obama portrait unveiling, uh, it, it's just it, Americans look to their presidents to be both head of state and head of government. And so Charles doesn't have to do the head of government. Uh, he's the head of state. Uh, he is the sovereign now. And so that actually does free him up. Uh, and it, it's one of the reasons there can be the longevity is that uh, the, the British population isn't going to necessarily blame Charles for high energy prices or high food prices or shortages uh, or inflation. Uh, they will blame Liz Truss. And that's why the Queen's reign endured through 15 prime ministers, uh, including, you know, over the last couple of years in pretty rapid succession, four conservative Tory prime ministers who did get blamed for those things. But none of them are elevated in the in the public consciousness the way that our presidents are here in the States. Well, earlier today, Prime Minister Liz Truss paid tribute to the Queen and offered her loyal service to the new king. Let's watch. During her first televised Christmas message in 1957, she said, today we need a special kind of courage so we can show the world that we are not afraid of the future. We need that courage now. In an instant yesterday, our lives changed forever. Today, we show the world that we do not fear what lies ahead. We send our deepest sympathy to all members of the royal family. We pay tribute to our late queen and we offer loyal service to our new king. That's Prime Minister Liz Truss earlier today. Uh, Hannah, you know, one hates to think of a death as being an opportunity and, and you know, we wanna be careful about how we frame and couch this, but is this a moment for Liz Truss to show and demonstrate some leadership and uh, and, and settle into this brand new role for her, just as King Charles will be doing, as the British people look to her. Absolutely. It is this moment um, for, for her to sort of transition from being, you know, one of two um, leading contenders in a contentious leadership race, uh, which, as in, you know, any moment in British politics, lots of sort of mockery abounds um, and, and lots of sort of wheelings and dealings, to step from that role of, like, a candidate who is, who is um, facing that kind of scrutiny to saying, well, now I am, you know, as we saw her yesterday, putting on her her dark clothes and coming out and doing, trying to, you know, do this rousing speech to unite the nation. Um, in this moment, um, it's certainly a big. Uh, uh, it could go either way if she is seen as not handling this, not paying her respects, uh, you know, to the to the satisfaction of the British public or the or, or media. Um, she will, you know, be critiqued for that too. But um, uh, it's really this moment of huge change in Britain at which she has found herself unwittingly uh, and very quickly one of the leading figures. 
If you're just joining us, a reminder that we expect to hear King Charles III uh, give a speech this afternoon, 1 o'clock Eastern Time, 6 o'clock London Time. You have a live shot there at Buckingham Palace, and that is where we're talking to Sarah Hewson, uh, a royal reporter who joins us from just outside the palace. Um, Sarah, you know, please go deeper into what Hannah was talking about, about this moment of trial and turmoil for the British people on every front, from looking at the war in Ukraine not too far away to the concerns of energy prices and the political instability that's been happening as we've churned through prime ministers. Yes, I think it is of great relief, actually, Libby, that uh, we have had that transition of prime ministers this week and that the Queen was able to conduct that constitutional duty. Because just imagine if we had been in the middle of a leadership contest with that process not yet resolved and the Queen had died. Already there is a nation feeling a sense of loss and almost um, untethered un because the Queen has been that anchor for so many people, the only monarch anyone has ever known. And I think the fact that she was able to carry out that last and very important constitutional duty, appointing her 15th Prime Minister, is hugely important. And it has been and is a time of great political upheaval, both here and around the world. And the King will have to reflect on that over the coming days. Whether or not he does that in his speech in the next what, hour and 45 minutes, we will have to wait to see. But also for the nation here, some of the details that I hadn't even comprehended, and you know, I've been following the royal family for many years now, and building up to this moment, planning and, and thinking about and preparing. But some of the details I hadn't even contemplated. A new face on the stamps. A new face on the banknotes, new initials on all of the post boxes. The police uniforms will have to change to reflect the new king. Military uniforms will change. So much that will need to change over the course of the coming months that I, I think it has almost been impossible to imagine until now. Boris Johnson, the previous Prime Minister, said in the House of Commons earlier that we've been almost childlike in thinking that the Queen would just go on and on, despite her advancing years, it has still come as something of a shock that actually now she's gone. Where does this leave Boris Johnson? I mean, what a, what a strange moment to have just lost your role as prime minister and then to be seeing all these tumultuous changes happen around you without holding power still. And Boris Johnson is, is renowned uh, as being a brilliant orator and I think for him to be sitting on the back benches as Boris Johnson MP for Uxbridge constituency rather than the Prime Minister to see his successor Liz Truss make that statement announcing the death of the Queen will have been incredibly difficult for him and just the timing of this to come just 48 hours after that transition of power, a transition that he didn't want, that he didn't see coming, um, I think he will be finding this very, very strange and very difficult indeed. But he gave a very fulsome tribute to the Queen in the House of Commons, and he, he managed to get a few laughs as well when he referenced in the midst of this very somber atmosphere, everyone dressed in black, everybody in mourning, paying their respects to the Queen. And Boris Johnson talked about her sense of humour and he brought up the moment that she parachuted into the 2012 Olympic Games opening ceremony with James Bond. And just what a remarkable moment that was. And again, we saw one at the Platinum Jubilee where she had tea with Paddington Bear. And I think um, to remember that side of the Queen as well, the mischievous side, the great sense of humour, the twinkle in the eye, is really important at a time like this. With us now, Post reporter Mary Jordan. Um, Mary, I'd like to hear you uh, expand on what Sarah was just talking about in terms of the, the Queen's personality and how everyone from Boris Johnson and beyond is remembering her. I think one key difference, and we're going to see this now when uh, her son steps up and uh, starts talking to the nation, 
is that she grew up and spent years uh, in the war uh, with, in, there were one light bulb in the private rooms of Buckingham Palace and Windsor where she was staying. She, she spent years of the war, you know, right there, right in Windsor Castle. And that made her kind of a thrifty person her whole life, not extravagant, which is a funny thing to say for somebody who lived in a palace. But her son did not grow up that way. And I think when lot, there's going to be a lot of discussion going forward about the different styles of the mother and the son. Um, and when you think of her, you kind of think of, um, you know, the lady who got through the war, you know, who could make her own cup of tea, who, you know, who, who was very subtle as she spoke. She said a lot by sometimes not saying anything. Well, Charles is quite opposite. He's outspoken. He's going to have to rein that in because he was famous for even sending letters to uh, elected officials about what he thought about urban planning and uh, architecture and sustainable farming and even fish. Uh, he was asked about that recently, and he said, you know, I'm not stupid. I know I have to change. And that wasn't that long ago. Well, now is the moment where we'll see that this woman who was so subtle and so kind of quiet, just always there, the reassuring rock, to her son, who has been outspoken and definitely is not as thrifty. He grew up with pretty much everything. And uh, I think there is a lot of interest in what he's going to be saying, because you know this is his first impression as king. And as they say, you can't, you don't have a second chance to make a first impression. Such a great point. I mean, James, uh, that really resonates. This is his opportunity. And, you know, even though the, the media airwaves are saturated with information and images, does this stand out, James, in terms of an opportunity and a responsibility uh, for the new king to make an impression? It really does. And what Mary just said uh, is, is a kind of a little illustration of how just different the British system is than our system. Uh, you know, when we're talking about Boris Johnson and Theresa May giving tribute speeches in the House of Commons, that's because they have a parliamentary system. And so their prime minister, when he is voted out, is still a member of parliament. Uh, we haven't had a, a former president uh, serve in Congress since John Quincy Adams. Uh, but also, you know, you, you talk about, uh, you know, Mary was just quoting Charles saying a few years ago, I know I have to change, I'm not stupid. Uh, you, you think back here to the Trump era, how many people thought that, oh, when Donald Trump becomes president, he's going to change the office of the presidency, is going to make him mature and act differently, uh, and, and that really didn't happen. And in a lot of ways, the presidency magnifies your strengths and weaknesses that you have coming into the job. But the British system is different. And there are different expectations. There is that bifurcated role between head of government and head of state. And Charles has shown himself capable of maturing uh, and of growing into this role. Uh, and and I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if he behaves quite differently. Uh, you know, it's, they say you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Uh, a lot of times it's hard to teach a 73-year-old uh, to behave in a different way. But again, because Charles is the longest uh, under, longest serving understudy in world history, the longest uh, heir in waiting to a throne, uh, he has had a lot of time to think about exactly how he's going to approach this job. And that's why the speech coming up in the next couple of hours is so high stakes, because everyone knows he's had decades to think about just what he wants to say. And that's why the pressure is really high, and that's why uh, the world is watching. Mary Jordan, a little bit earlier, Sarah said this has been a very long apprenticeship for Charles, and that is certainly an understatement. I mean, he has been waiting in the wings for so many decades. Talk to us about the preparation for this moment and, and you know, how that preparation ultimately is different than actually having to rise to the occasion on this very day. I think the pressure of the whole world's eyes on you is something that unless you've felt it, uh, as he has, uh, it's hard to prepare for. But boy, when um, Princess Diana died, he felt it. He's felt it at other times when there's been scandals about his brother or about now his two kids not getting along. So I, I guess I think that the most important training he's had is to be in the public eye. 
the, the global eye. You know, just in the Commonwealth, there's two billion people. Uh, and that means that you're trying to get along or at least not irk or anger too many people all at the same time. And you know, along with that, um, you know, he's been mocked for some of the issues that he's taken up. His own father didn't like it when he was years, decades ago, talking about urban renewal, uh, trying to preserve historic buildings. You know, his father said to him, you know, couldn't you do something else? Why don't you just knock down those buildings? He's been used to the ridicule even among those close to him. And so I guess I think backbone, you know, with, you know, he's learned that uh, thing that his mother had, that you kind of get through it and you smile. Very noticeable this morning how at ease and happy he looks. He went out in the crowd at Buckingham Palace shaking hands. Very smart move also that it was raining when he was leaving Scotland and he, he didn't, he, he waved his hand and didn't want the umbrella. He just walked in the rain. Uh, I think that he's learned a few things by watching his mother as well. Mary, what is the role of Camilla in this moment? Um, we were watching her body language, certainly, as she watched her husband, the king, uh, greet his royal subjects. I love that question because Camilla is the underappreciated person that I think is really going to rise in the next few, few weeks and years to come. Um, people first didn't like her, you know, their opinion polls. She was the other woman. They loved beautiful, younger Diana. Why was this the third woman? But she is, those who know her, um, I've met her several times. She has this gravelly voice, great sense of humor, laughs. Noticeably, when she's in the room, Charles is happier, he lo the way he looks at her. Um, she is going to stay quiet. She is not as glamorous um, as Princess Diana was, who, who was. Uh, she'll be a little bit in the background, and I think she is going to have um, tons of memes, tons of fans, and tons of people saying, uh, hey, she's kind of an interesting woman, isn't she? She's got this, uh, she's the queen, but she's kind of got a little special distance because of the past with Princess Diana, but I think she's going to be someone to watch. I think she's a force. I think she's very smart. I think she's very funny. And I think that we have yet to really hear from her, but as the world does, I think they're going to like her. Mary, uh, does the role of Camilla's family change here? I mean, you know, she had a life before she married Charles, the future king. And so what happens to all of the people in her family in her orbit? Great question, because there are always the inconvenient relatives. And, you know, no doubt that's going to be part of the ongoing saga of the royal family when um, her kids and their wives meet, you know, Harry and Meghan. And, uh, all that is to come. But, but uh, it is true that Prince Charles spends quite a lot of time uh, with her kids from another marriage. And so it's going to be kind of a super modern world. A little bit messy, sometimes a whole lot messy. Uh, and I think that's kind of part of the reason that so many people are fascinated by these people. Because on one hand, they're like no one else in the world because they get their job just by being born. And on the other hand, they're like everybody else. They have divorces and spats and weird, uh, you know, Christmas parties um, and uncomfortable days. So stay tuned. I only have great Christmas parties, but that's that that's just me. Um, so, you know, Mary, I, I'm so curious about, though, that other part of the messy family life, which is Harry and William, of course, and and how the public eye it seems like the public eye couldn't be any hungrier because it's already so hungry for information about those two brothers and about their wives. What changes in terms of their relationship and their role here as they watch their father take the throne? I think that they can do themselves a big favor uh, by how close they stand together. There'll be a lot of eyes on these two, two boys when uh, in the days to come there's different ceremonies. It'll be noted, you know, if they're smiling, how close they are together. Uh, in the British press, there has been a lot of negativity about Meghan, and she's seen by many people, not all. 
but by many people as being the person who, you know, put a wedge between the boys, as they say, who, who uh, were so close, you know, who... So uh, Prince Charles has got to step up here and really kind of command um, that the family kind of stick together and, and put on a good face. You know, who, who wants two brothers who, who've been through so much, including losing their mother so horribly and when they were so young? So I think Charles, who, who is really relishes the role of father and grandfather, that will be one of the big things that he's going to do here. And everyone's going to be watching. I think Meghan and Kate, noticeably not there in Balmoral when she died. Um, many people think that Kate was asked not to go because it made it look better when Megan wasn't. So that, that news about, oh no, Megan's the only one out, didn't dominate when the Queen was dying. So probably you'll see a little bit of hangback from Kate and Megan. Um, but you know who's going to steal the show are the little kids. They're unbelievably adorable. And that they're, you know, all the cameras, you know, it's almost like a magnet that they're going to be going to little George and Charlotte. Um, and we'll see, of course, whether Harry and Meghan's kids uh, uh, come on the scene in the, in the coming days as well. So, um, Sarah, I'd like to go back to you for more on this relationship and this question of whether or not King Charles can sort of control his family in some way. And um, it's, it's sort of old-fashioned to think of the patriarch or the family leader demanding a certain decorum or or action from his children. Um, but what is the power or role of Charles to uh, work with his children right now and his uh, children's spouses to come together and show unity at this moment? Well, I think right now he has quite a lot on his plate. He could do without any family feuds to be dealing with as well. But I think we've shown Prince Charles as he was, King Charles now, displaying quite a firm hand when it has come to family matters of late. And also Prince William, his son. The Queen, it's always been said that Prince Andrew, the Duke of York, was her favourite son. And when it was the service of remembrance for Prince Philip, the Duke of York then took his mother by the arm and walked her in. That was seen as hugely controversial given the scandal that has surrounded him. But we were led to believe that that was a decision taken by his mother, that this was a family event. When it came to the garter ceremony, which is a, a, a big, very traditional, old order ceremony that takes place in Windsor, the Duke of York wanted to attend, and he wanted to attend in his full garter robes. And he was told in no uncertain terms by the Prince of Wales and and by Prince William that that was not to happen, that that would not be OK. And I think discussions will certainly have been going on in the weeks leading up to the death of the Queen. We know that Charles had been visiting his mother on a daily basis at Balmoral. The Duke of York had also been there. About the future, the role for the Duke of York and what that might look like, what the Queen's wishes were, but also how Charles will handle this. And as for his son Harry, well, by coincidence, he, he was in the country at this moment. But it is notable that he didn't fly with other members of the royal family. There may be a purely practical reason for that, but he flew alone. He got there after the death of the Queen, and he left early this morning. And I don't think, until this moment, we've seen any kind of signs of reconciliation between them. Charles's people say, well, he always has an open invitation to them. But I think there's a lack of trust. And what now unfolds, we will have to wait and see, because the stakes have got a huge deal higher. Sarah, for those of us who may have just joined us in the last little while, talk to us again about what we know about the Queen's final hours, who was able to make it to her bedside, and uh, who arrived after her death. Yes, Libby, I think what is quite special here in some ways is that the Queen was able to spend her final weeks in a very, very important place to her, Balmoral, up in the Scottish Highlands. It was very dear to her late father and became very dear to her and Prince Philip as well. It is actually the place where they got engaged. And it is, according to their granddaughter, Princess Eugenie, uh, the place they were at their happiest. She said they absolutely 
absolutely loved it there, surrounded by dogs. They would be woken by a lone piper beneath the window of their bedroom in Balmoral Castle every day. And so for the Queen to have her final days and hours there is very special and will give great comfort to those who are mourning her at the moment. She had had many visits over the course of the summer from members of the royal family, including the Cambridge family, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and their children, uh, the Prince of Wales, the Duke of York. And on the day of her death, Prince Charles, as he was, uh, King Charles, as we now have to get used to calling him, um, was in Scotland. He was at another house, Dumfries House in Ayrshire. He was travelled by helicopter to be with his mother. He was there. Princess Anne also was in Scotland on engagements, so she was there. But the remaining members of the royal family, uh, the Queen's two sons, Andrew and Edward, her grandson, Prince William, they flew up on an RAF uh, military jet, but they didn't make it there in time, and nor did Prince Harry. They were, though, able to come together as a family after that. And, and I think that there will have been a degree of shutting themselves away just for that night last night before returning here. And as we saw, King Charles coming here to, to face what is his destiny, his future now, well, actually, his present. He is is now the monarch. Yeah, Sarah, one, one does wonder and reflect on what that night was like for them. And you make such an important point that it was sort of the calm before the storm and they could have that privacy. And if they chose time together as a family to process their great loss and prepare for the intense public scrutiny and focus that is to come. Um, you know, here in the States, home to Harry and Meghan, uh, many people view them very fondly. They find them to be electric and, and, and youthful and exciting. Um, but the British press has been savage to, uh, to them. Um, so what is this return and homecoming like uh, for that couple? Oh, I think we just lost the signal. So I'll turn that question to Hannah Jewell. Hannah, you were at the wedding of Meghan and Harry. And even in the short time since then, the public perception has, has really changed. And of course, we have to remember who this is led by, right? Is this the public leading or is it the press, which has an agenda leading in the UK? And, and the public is sort of, you know, being batted about as they watch uh, some of these intense uh, criticisms and rivalries played out in the British press, which is very different than the American press. I remember wondering this in 2018 as there was this sort of fairy tale moment, a royal wedding um, that, of course, British press loves. Uh, I remember wondering how long it might be before um, the whole system, the sort of nature of the sort of the, the control of the royal family over its members, all of this would sort of get to Meghan Markle, now the Duchess of Sussex, uh, given her fundamental Americanness, right, and having gone from being this. Um, you know, independent, this actor, this, she had a lifestyle brand in that world, um, being obviously uh, a lot of uh, press attention as, a, as an actor and, and then as the, the sort of date of Prince Harry. But um, how, how much, uh, it's, it's hard to overstate um, how horrible the British press can be to those it has turned against. You have seen these really obvious sort of um, contrasts uh, between the way that particularly Meghan, as a biracial woman, has been treated compared to Kate. Um, things as simple as images of, of, of Meghan placing, keeping her hands on her belly when she was pregnant was sort of shown as being like showy or fake versus the same stories being written about Kate as how wonderful and maternal. Things like this. And it's an interesting thing when we, when we analyze this sort of this element of drama in the royal family how much is it uh, people like to pin things on Meghan and I think that kind of overlooks the agency that Harry himself has and it's something that he has spoken about um, how their decision to you know abdicate not really abdicate but abdicate to California uh, was driven by what he saw and his his anger at the British press for their hounding of his mother what that did to her mental health how stifled she was in the palace and controlled him beginning to see that happening to his wife. And, um, you know, it's not as if he could have gone to California without his own consent. I think that um, he made a decision to sort of protect his family from all of that uh, because 
I don't think anyone can understand until they're in it what it actually means to be a royal. Um, obviously, the, the luxury, the privilege, all of this, but also having lost all sense of control of your own life to the, to the point of, of what nail varnish color you can wear. Um, I think that uh, it's such an interesting thing to see the, the legacy of Diana shaping that continued, you know, drama seems like a crass word to describe the situation, this fallout. It's not just two brothers fighting. It's, it's, it, there's something deeper to it there, whether or not there will be this, like, the longed for reconciliation. I don't think at least British tabloid press is, is necessarily eager for that. They have a punching bag in Harry and Meghan that they would be loath to give up, I think. Um, and you can see whatever events happen in the royal family that tabloids, can, there can sort of spin to, to, to blame on this couple and particularly on Meghan is sort of an incredibly rapid decline from that moment in 2018 where it was about how sort of lovely everything was. There was this romance and this magic of this wedding um, to the sort of grim reality of what it means to be a royal in Britain, particularly one on the wrong side of the press. Sarah Hewson, uh, can you talk more about just what the expectations are on, on Harry and Meghan in this moment? And if, if they can come to this moment as authentic people, or if they still will be sort of bound by and controlled by the protocol and the routine and the expectations put on the royal family. I think what will be really interesting is the kind of public reception they get now after the death of the Queen, because there is a sadness that the final months of the Queen's life were very difficult in many ways as a result of family troubles, the, the scandal surrounding the Duke of York and his association with Jeffrey Epstein and Harry and Meghan and that interview on Oprah Winfrey and the claims that were made about a member of the royal family making a racist remark, for example, hugely damaging to the monarchy. And the Queen, I think, always took a pragmatic view that this would play out over time and that in time the family might come back together, that the, the noise around this would stop and they would come back together. And she has always made it clear that Harry and Meghan remained very much loved members of the family. But I wonder what the British public reaction will be to them now after the Queen's death. They were in Manchester on Monday in the north of England attending uh, an event for One Young World. Meghan gave a speech there. Some of the headlines were not kind, um, as you have described in the aftermath of that speech. She has had her podcast out and she's talked a little bit about the way in which she was received in Britain. And, and she suggested that perhaps, you know, is this because I'm an American? And I think there is a British stiff upper lip mentality. And, and the royal family never complain, never explain. And Meghan, someone much more open, someone much more prepared to talk about what her experiences are. And that doesn't always sit easily here with some. And the media, you are right, has taken a different approach to the Duchess of Cambridge uh, as to Meghan. And, you can compare comparable events and see a very different take on it. And we know that uh, Prince Harry and Meghan have had a very tough time with the media. But they, there is also a great degree of sadness that a family has fallen apart in this way and that two brothers who were once so very close are now miles and miles apart, highlighted last weekend when they were both just a short distance away. 300 metres apart from each other on the Windsor estate in their respective homes and yet didn't see each other. So I think there will be a sense of hope now that this moment could be a moment for change and, and really propel them to sort this out. Sarah, how much of this has to do with duty and responsibility and the responsibility now on William and how he perceives his role in the family? 
Well, that's always been the difference, hasn't it, between William and Harry. One knew that he would succeed to the throne at, one, at some stage. The other was the spare, effectively. And that was a difficult role for, for Harry to carve out, while it also gave him greater freedoms. There's a huge amount of responsibility now on William's shoulders, as he will, in the not-too-distant future, become the Prince of Wales, taking on his father's title. And I think we will see him in a very prominent role, supporting his father, and and he is having to rise to that challenge pretty rapidly. He's known it's coming, but nothing really could ease that transition other than just getting on with it. And he's been watching his father, he's been watching his grandmother. He's a man who knows his own mind, and he will know how he wants the future of the monarchy to look, because what his father does is really important now to the monarchy and the nation that he will inherit. And I think we will see him having a great degree of input into that. Mary Jordan, uh, what is the role of all of these other um, family members around Charles when, when we look at William and Harry and, and, and what their roles are here, not just literally in terms of succession or sort of being out very far down the line of succession, uh, but as they support Charles III as king, does their duty and responsibility to him change? Yes, I think quite a lot changes. Uh, Queen Elizabeth talked about her relationship with her own sister. She was so close to Margaret. And it changed because she all of a sudden was had a new role. She wasn't just her sister, but she had to enforce the rules as she saw it to continue the good name of the monarchy. So I think a lot will change. But you bring up a really important question because many people are expecting uh, Prince King Charles, uh, to slim down the royals. You know, there's a lot of cousins and, and um, you know, I mean, how far when you get the tree to, do you go? And, and how many perks should they have? Um, one of the ways to modernize uh, and, very importantly, uh, to slim down costs is that you will see a tighter focus on the the family and so that there you know that there's not kind of what they call the grace and favor perks for for a wider group of people when princess diana came to washington um, it was not long bef right before she died uh, she was here um, visiting um, the former owner of the washington post catherine graham and catherine graham had a big party for princess diana and I was standing there, and Barbara Walters was also there. And she said to Princess Diana, you know, I was at your, your wedding, and I remember all those lesser royals. And Diana went, oh my, she, her, her, she just kind of flinched at her whole body, and she said, oh, the lesser royals. I hate that term. But it was this moment where, you know, this quite a lot of them, and it'll be very interesting to see if he puts his foot down and says, you know, we have a lot of lands, we have a lot of palaces, we have a lot of places everywhere, and we really need to trim back. Uh, so I think stay tuned on that point. It's a really good one. Mm. Uh, to be on a, a fly on the wall, Mary, and uh, and to have been with you uh, through some of those experiences you've had. I can't wait to hear more about them over the coming days uh, during our coverage. It's just so fascinating. Um, uh, Sarah Houston, I want to go back to you uh, to talk a little bit more about the relationship of Charles with his family and how it changes. I mean, one of the things that was to take place was that uh, family members, if I have this correct, would be kissing the hand of Charles when his mother passed, sort of elevating and showing the relationship and the change of his status and importance in succession. Yes, according to tradition, uh, family members who were there at the moment that he became king would kiss his hand. So we know that his sister, Princess Anne, was there at the same time. Whether it happened, we don't know. We, we ha also have the kissing hand ceremony when you have uh, one prime minister appointed by the Queen. And actually, nowadays, it doesn't involve the actual kissing of hands. It involves a, a handshake and either a bow or a curtsy. We won't know what went on in that room, but I think um, this 
changes the dynamics of the family hugely because uh, rather than four children of the monarch, we now have a monarch and his three siblings. The line of succession changes. Uh, we. It is enormous for Charles, but it is also very big for his siblings as well, who will have to step up even further to support him. They have also lost their mother, and this is a moment of, of national mourning, but it is also a family grieving as well. And it is family that are going to have to grieve in a very public forum, because over the course of the coming days and into next week and beyond to Monday the 19th of September when we expect the funeral to take place. The nation will be looking to them. After the death of the Duke of Edinburgh, I was in Windsor and the Earl and Countess of Wessex came out. They'd just been to visit the Queen to pay their condolences and the Countess of Wessex wound down her window and was talking to people there who'd gathered, who stopped to talk to the media and told us that the Queen was amazing, quite remarkable. And they also went to church and they came out and spoke to the well-wishers there. We've seen the King do it here outside Buckingham Palace, but I think over the course of the coming days we may well see other members of the family coming out and making themselves publicly visible, even in their time of great private grief, because that is their duty. This is no ordinary family, is it? Sarah, you were covering Prime Minister Liz Truss's visit up to Balmoral Castle earlier this week. Tell us about those last moments we witnessed in the Queen's public life. I think this is really quite significant and important. The Queen's health was obviously fading. And she may well have been advised that she could pass on that duty to her heir, the Prince of Wales, uh, Charles now, King Charles. But she was very much determined that she would do that and carry out that very key constitutional role, transferring power from one prime minister to the next, from Boris Johnson to Liz Truss. And we had these beautiful images, I think, of the Queen standing in the drawing room at Balmoral Castle, wearing her tartan skirt and a cardigan and a huge smile on her face. And, and to be honest, she looked like everybody's grandmother. There, was, there were no robes, there was no formality about this, even though it was a very formal duty. And, and she looked very happy. And I think for her to have gone out with such dignity, doing the job that she was born to do, the job that on her 21st birthday she swore that she would do for her whole life, whether it be long or short, and she would devote herself to that duty. And she did, right up until the end, carrying out that very important role just two days before the end of her life. And she's a very proud, she was a very dignified woman. She would not have wanted to be seen fading. She didn't want to be seen in a wheelchair. She didn't want the public to see her looking frail. And she did look frail, but she looked happy and dignified, and I think that was really important to her. Sarah Hewson live outside of Buckingham Palace. Thank you so much. And Sarah will continue to join us over the coming days of coverage. We are so grateful uh, for your insights and time, Sarah. Mary Jordan, I want to go to you on these last months of the Queen's life and her celebration of uh, uh, the Platinum Jubilee and then also the preparations that she was able to do to take some concrete steps to prepare for the next generation. Everything from in ensuring how Camilla would be described and sort of categorized uh, as, as the future queen consort, um, to also helping her son prepare for his inevitable role. I think that showed her wisdom. She knew that if people said the queen said this was OK, in, in Camilla's case, that was key. If the queen said, you know, Prince Andrew has you know, made a mistake and he's going to take the consequences and have things stripped, but I'm going to walk with him, that showed that he's still going to be there. He still is in the immediate family, but yet there'll be no money from the government paying for things that he does. She knew, and that's why she was doing so many things at the end. It was like very important housekeeping um, because she knew that her son is going to have challenges. 
uh, and he could always, at least in the in the, what could be a rocky transition, people would know, hey, that wasn't really Charles, that was the Queen's wish. Uh, and I think that the part about insisting that she be there for, for the new prime minister two days before she died was vintage Queen Elizabeth. She didn't like her job when it started, but I think she really did like her job in the, in the end. I think she had some satisfaction that she had done it well uh, and that the, she was so doubtful, so self-deprecating, you know, and, and people didn't help by saying, who is this young woman who doesn't know that much uh, being the head of state? Uh, she came, people have said that I talked to who worked directly with her, that she said, you know, maybe I wasn't so bad at that. And that's pretty good satisfaction as you head to out the door. Uh, wouldn't it be lovely for all of us to go out this way? Her father suffered terribly uh, from lung disease. Uh, she is the woman who wanted to be in the James Bond movie, and she kind of had a James Bond ending here. Mary, what does it mean to prepare to be king? You know, you talk about how the queen was able to grow into the role and not just uh, flourish in that role, but learn to love it and learn to find a way to navigate it that she loved. What does it mean to prepare to be king? I think, again, it is... Prince Charles, when he was Prince Charles all those years, knew the problems with that job. You know, he was constantly criticized. He was under the microscope. He was bullied at school. You know, he talked about and wrote about how they threw pillows at him and they threw slippers at the wall and they kind of mocked him like, oh, you just have this job because of who your mommy is. So he knew the bad parts. Becoming king now is kind of taking hold of what could be the influential and the good parts. Uh, I think every, we've seen a whole years and years of what really drives Prince Charles. He often talks whether it's about uh, fishing and sustainable farming and you know climate change. It's the conditions of living. He says he wants to improve people's conditions of living. When he was criticized for speaking out and getting political as a member of the royal family, he said, I know I'm not supposed to, but I'm doing it because it's about people's lives and I want to make them better. So now he's king and he has some power and it's going to be really interesting how he uses this amazing platform, amazing global platform, to do what he's been more quietly doing in the shadow of Queen Elizabeth. It is exactly noon here on the East Coast in Washington, D.C., where Mary and I are, 5 o'clock in London in Buckingham Palace. You see that live image there. And we are expecting a pre-taped speech coming from King Charles in about an hour. Uh, and we will wait to see uh, what the new king has to say. The, the ascension ceremony has not yet taken place, but Mary, he became king the moment his mother died. Uh, I'm curious, Mary, to hear from you what this moment means for the preparation of his children and how, you know, uh, a William and Kate now have to think about preparing their children because there sort of seemed like this insurmountable hurdle of, of the queen and her longevity that stood between them and the throne and now suddenly that's just been so compressed and it almost seems to be right around the corner in some way. Oh, for sure. It, you know, it's a difference between being in the uh, dugout and being, you know, next up to bat. Uh, you start getting nervous. You start swinging the bat. Um, and I think they're obviously know that this was coming and then certainly been preparing for it, but now it's getting real. Uh, Prince Charles is only 73, but we certainly know that things can happen. Um, Queen Elizabeth has some pretty mighty genes. Her mother lived to 101. She lived to 96. But we don't know where, uh, what, what will happen with Prince Charles. And so they must be uh, both excited nervous. Uh, they have three children. Um, 
let's just hope that those three children, you know, that I think that we'll be seeing Harry and Meghan's two children, Lily Bet and Archie. Um, and I think that they're going to probably have many years before they have to take over. I think now is the time, and it does come at funerals and weddings and big events, especially now when the two brothers live so far apart, that there is a chance with this long rollout and the ceremonies, and maybe something good will happen. Uh, you know, we, if you're religious as, you, as the Queen Elizabeth was, she often talked about how she prayed, uh, she's going to have a big presence over that in some way. And, and maybe some of it is to unite this family that, you know, has been through a hell of a lot. Mary Jordan, correspondent for The Washington Post. Mary, I am looking forward over the coming days to hearing more of your stories uh, about Princess Diana and beyond. So thank you so much for talking with us. Uh, Hannah Jewell, let's go to you on the line of succession and just how this works. Because as we were just hearing from Mary, you know, there was this, you know, difference of of being in the dugout versus being kind of getting ready to get at bat. So talk us through how the line of succession works and how it's changed even over the last few years. So um, to, I can't keep putting it in baseball terms, unfortunately. I don't have that vocabulary under my uh, wraps, but, but certainly the dugout has moved up one, one notch. That's not right. Um, we see for the first time in 70 years um, that there is a change, that there is um, everyone is moving up one uh, in the line of succession to the throne. Um, and we have a graphic actually sort of showing how this works. Um, the way this works is not by age or seniority, really, but it goes down the line of the eldest child. So you have the queen having passed away. You have Charles now as King Charles. Um, you see there um, his, his former wife, Diana, and current wife, Camilla. Um, from there it goes, uh, it, it basically surpasses his two um, siblings, um, or th rather three, um, to Prince William is now the first in line to the throne, and Prince George, who is nine years old. You see how the, the children um, supplant Harry um, and his, his heirs in this, in this line, um, and actually it wasn't until 2013 that uh, the royal family ended male preference primogeniture, so meaning that had um, Charlotte been born before uh, George, her brother, she would have been next in line. Um, whereas you saw in previous generations or two generations previous to them, um, Andrew, Duke, the Duke of York, um, was in the line of succession despite being younger than Princess Anne. Um, due to that rule, which only changed quite recently. Um, then you have, you have uh, just a lot of sort of babies in the line here before you come back to Harry um, and then Harry's children. After that, you then get back to the um, two generations previously, um, the, the Duke of York, his eldest daughter, Princess Beatrice, and then her, her eldest child, Sienna Elizabeth. Um, so you, you see the, the things only really uh, change in the event of, you know, new births. Um, if William and Kate were to have another child, this would knock everyone below them down another rung. Um, but you, as you see, the children sort of supplant their uncles and aunts and, and their cousins and so on. Um, the only other really way this can change is in the event of an abdication which is how the late queen's father, George VI, became king after the abdication of her uncle, Edward VIII, which happened in 1936 and set off a sort of constitutional crisis. Um, it might not have seemed clear in that time. This was such a, such a huge disruptive moment that the monarchy would survive nearly a century later to this point. Um, but you see sort of uh, how this line now is so much closer um, suddenly just this week to uh, a nine-year-old boy being being um, only two seats away from the throne. So um, I'm going to send it back to James in the studio. James, I'm curious if you think, um, as, as everyone is wondering and, and sort of in the back of people's minds this week, whether William and Harry will reconcile, whether this um, series of events today will offer them that opportunity. Yeah, I, I you know, I, like any family, uh, Hannah, deaths can bring people closer together or they can deepen divisions. And, uh, you know, I think that that lack of trust, as Sarah put it a few minutes ago, really is a very serious. It's hard to overstate the damage that that Oprah interview did when Harry uh, told Oprah uh, that 
members of his family didn't want him to marry Megan and suggested it was because of the color of her skin and that uh, they asked what their children would look like. Uh, you know, but when you think about dynastic tensions, uh, literally, there, there's nothing more than the royal family where that comes into play. But these kinds of uh, brother against brother tensions are, are so central to not just British history, but literally the Bible uh, and Shakespeare and the, the Harry and William story uh, sometimes feels like it could be in great literature. You know, you think to Cain and Abel and Jacob and Esau and Joseph and his 11 brothers and Moses, Moses Aaron and Miriam and Peter and Andrew in the Bible. But there are also, uh, there's a lot of Shakespeare uh, tension between brothers. And uh, in Henry IV, part one, uh, Prince John of Lancaster does his royal duty while his brother, Prince Hal, lives it up in the uh, East Cheap Tavern and in a lot of ways, they're, they're really, you know, when you look at Henry IV, there are similarities between Prince John and Prince William uh, and uh, Prince Hal and Prince Harry. Uh, and so I, the, the, these tensions are so endemic uh, in any family where there's an heir and a spare. And uh, as you noted, Hannah, it, it's really true that now a, a nine-year-old boy is uh, second in line to the throne uh, but the British have rules and regulations. So in theory, uh, he could become the king if something happened to his father and grandfather. Uh, but Prince George uh, wouldn't be able to exercise his royal duties until he becomes an adult by turning 18. Hannah? It's interesting reporting this week, James, from, from the US, and many of us will be in the UK shortly, um, on these issues from the distance of, you know, being Americans who can view these people as, as sort of distant celebrities with an air of glamour, glamour and everything, can view the sibling rivalries as sort of drama. I'm curious if you think that Americans would view um, the royal family differently if this is getting way back, 1776, if, uh, if they were indeed our royal family still. Do you think that there's more space to sort of admire and follow the royals as Americans? Yeah, very much, and because we can really look at this like it's reality television, and I think in some ways uh, we can be uh, more enchanted by the royal family because we're not paying for it. You know, I think about all the things, you know, you hear, uh, we spend a lot of time out talking to voters who get angry about wastes of taxpayer money, uh, and uh, we're not paying for the, the royal allowances, uh, as Mary Jordan was talking about, for these lesser royals. And so I think it can be sort of amusing to us. And now there is enough distance that, uh, you know, 1776 was, a, we're actually coming up on the 250th anniversary in the next couple of years uh, of, of our independence. And so it, 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 it's not the same, it's not as raw as I think it was even in the 1930s uh, when, before World War II, when that special relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom really became special. Hannah, I'm so curious about how much succession is on the minds of people in the UK and how, how much, I mean, is this something, is the, you, you are British, is this something that every school child in the UK grows up knowing the, the, the line of succession or are they puzzling through all this just as we are? Um, growing up British, but in the American school system I, for, for most of my childhood where I think that um, one thing that, I mean, British kids have to learn so much royal history that only kind of comes up in American education when it's coming to the American Revolution, right? Um, but it is certainly um, something that is such a huge part of, of British education and, and culturally following all these figures, not necessarily that people can rattle off like who's number seven versus who's number eight, um, but sort of putting them in, in their minds in order of importance culturally, in order of how much scrutiny they get from the media according to how far they are, are up this pecking order. Um, and, and it's just sort of interesting to see that uh, play out and how we do now have three male heirs um, half after this 70-year reign um, of a woman and, and with no real potential uh, unless Prince George, you know, has a daughter for another queen for some time. And also how, uh, how sort of strange it is to be, to be pre peering into the private lives of, of this family and, and of a child in particular to, to look for an heir. It feels very, again, you know, literally medieval, biblical, as far back as we've had royal families. 
Let's go to Lewis Goodall, an, an, an analyst and investigations editor for the Global News in London. Uh, hello, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm interested to hear from you how this first week has been. Uh, what, an, what a strange and memorable week for Liz Truss, the new prime minister. Tell us about this. Well, absolutely, Libby. I mean, you know, we've got to remember that the Queen had had 15 prime ministers. She, Boris Johnson was her 14th prime minister up until Tuesday. And Liz Truss became her 15th on Tuesday. And there were a couple of images that were released of so-called kissing hands when the prime minister goes and becomes appointed by the Queen. It had never happened at Balmoral before in Scotland. Typically, this happens either at Windsor or at Buckingham Palace. But such was, we were told, the Queen's the mobility issues that she had, that for the first time, the, the outgoing prime minister and incoming prime minister went to Scotland. And of course, those were the last images we ever saw of her alive. It was an extraordinary, just as a human, I suppose, just an, it was an extraordinary experience for Liz Truss to have. She comes back down to London. She makes her first speech as prime minister outside 10 Downing Street. And the next day, she's due to be making a big intervention on what's going to happen to energy prices in the UK, which have been skyrocketing. And we were all saying, people like me were going on the television and so on and saying, look, this is the big moment, the biggest moment for the Liz Trust Premiership. If she doesn't get this right on Thursday, that is it, game over. And yet there we were watching the House of Commons. She was making that speech and suddenly we saw little bits of paper being passed up and down the Commons, both to her and to her opposite number, the leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer. And suddenly their faces went ashen. And we all in the press gallery started talking about it and speculating. And we all kind of knew what it was, that it must be the Queen. And then she has to, later that evening, because go only on her second full day as Prime Minister, address the nation and try and articulate some of the sorrow and unease that a nation who literally had not changed monarch for 70 years was now feeling. It's quite a responsibility. Mm, it's, it's hard to imagine and, and so memorable. You know, We've had some of our guests observe that this could be an incredible sort of bonding moment and connection between King Charles and Prime Minister Truss uh, because they are both entering this strange and challenging new world simultaneously. What will you be watching in terms of their relationship and this perhaps unique bond that, that they're forming in this moment? Well, look, first things first, it is extraordinary that this has happened in the same week. You have to go all the way back to 1830 in the UK to find a prime minister and a sovereign, a monarch, changing in the same year, let alone the same week. And that was William IV and the Duke of Wellington. So, you know, this is just extraordinary. It is, of course, possible. Look, these are two people who are not ingenues in politics, in British politics, right? So you've got Charles has had the longest apprenticeship in British history. He's 73 years of age. He's the oldest monarch. Again, William IV was actually the oldest monarch before him to become uh, the king. So he keeps popping up a lot. But he's the oldest monarch. So he has had a long time to prepare for this moment. Liz Truss, likewise, has not come from nowhere. She was a foreign secretary. She's been a senior cabinet minister for some time. So we're talking about experienced people. But yeah, of course, they're going to have a unique bond. The uh, prime minister, she will be, she's already met him today for their first audience. And both of them are going to have to try and find their way. But it is extraordinary to consider that at the start of this week, Britain had one monarch and one prime minister. And by the end of the week, both have changed. It's remarkable. Uh, talk to us about the Queen and her prime ministers. Um, you know, Winston Churchill was her first. And just looking at the images of their uh, them back in that era, it's just, Lewis, it's just such a, truly a different world when you look at that young Queen Elizabeth and Winston Churchill truly from a different era. Tell us about those relationships over time. Yeah, like I say, it is extraordinary. She's had 50, she had 15 prime ministers. When you consider that her first prime minister, Winston Churchill, was born in, I think, 1875. Liz Truss, her last prime minister, was born in 1974. So you literally have a century of, of time pass between these prime ministers. And, you know, when you consider the Queen's life, and I think this is in the end why she was, uh, you know, it was an extraordinary life and why she had a such unique relationship, not just with Britain, but the world. You know, she embodied... A different era. She was the last link for Britain, but also for uh, the world of a gone era, of the era of the Second World War. 
Uh, and because she had known all of these people, whether it was Churchill or Clement Attlee or Harold Wilson or Harold Macmillan and all of these sorts of people who to, you know, people like me and people much older than me are figures from history. Or in an American case, you know, knowing people like Truman or Kennedy or Eisenhower, it allowed us to feel that visceral link with our own past, right? She embodied it and now she's gone. But her relationship with those prime ministers, all of them, the remarkable thing in many ways, and they were all very different people, those 15 people, and yet all of them never had, not only a bad word to say about her, but seemed to genuinely relish the relationship. Watching the House of Commons today with Theresa May talking about her, for example, of Boris Johnson, they always said the same thing. Those, those weekly meetings that you had were the only time when you could genuinely sort of let rip and you knew that nothing was going to leave or leak from that meeting. A lot of prime ministers, it's really interesting to consider, a lot of prime ministers often talk about it almost like in a, as a sort of psychotherapy kind of role. You know, they could go into Buckingham Palace and just say, oh my God, I've had a hell of a week. And it was a very informal kind of chat. And the whole point of those, there's no real reason for those meetings to happen, but they all drew on her very long experience. And, you know, they would occasionally say things like, oh, I'm having this problem with a world leader. And then she would say, oh, I knew their father, you know, you know, and so, so, you know, that kind of depth of experience is just irreplaceable. Um, but of course, you know, and, uh, you know, but of course that new relationship, as we say, between Truss and now King Charles will have to be forged and he will have to forge his own relationship with his prime ministers in the years to come. Mm. Uh, finally, Lewis, give us a sense of the scale of this era defining moment for the British people. Well, like I say, I think the reason why, look, for a start, if you consider the first half of the 20th century, it was not unusual for the population wouldn't have found it unusual for the king or queen to change, right? Winston Churchill, actually, in the 1952 accession debate, when the queen came to the throne, he remarked to the commons that uh, I have seen four kings go, come and go since I've been an MP. It's totally different now. You know, they'd had kings or queen, Queen Victoria died in 1901. Edward VII died in 1910, George V died in 1936, and George VI died in 1952. It was sort of commonplace. People just got used to it. It was part of life. None of us have had that. You know, she has been this element of stability in a not only a, 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 a dramatic period for Britain, but an epochal change of one for Britain, right? You know, it goes from this hyper-imperial power to a very different sort of country. And so, and yet throughout, she was there as this sort of North Star in the sky. And she's that gone. And so it is a big psychological blow. And even saying the words, thing like the king is doing this. No one had said that in Britain for 70 years. The king is doing this. That is just a psychological change. And look, life will go on. We shouldn't be too dramatic about this. And of course, life will go on. But I think there's an awareness that, you know, nothing will be quite the same. And, you know, there will be a long period of, of gratitude, I think. For what you know, even if you don't necessarily so believe in the monarchy or whatever, that she did that job pretty much as well as anyone could possibly expect anyone to do it. Lewis Goodall, analysis and investigations editor for Global News in London. He's also co host of uh, the podcast The News Agents. Thank you so much, Lewis. Really appreciate My your pleasure. time. Um, Hannah Jewell, you know, this idea of the Queen as North Star is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very poetic. Uh, but the thing about the North Star is you always know where it is. You can always find it. And even if you're not someone who perhaps is romantic about the monarchy, is this still a sense of loss and change for people who might even be Republicans and sort of anti-monarchy or might even be people who chafe at that structure and, and old ritual but, but still are just so used to her being there? Oh, of course, just enormously disruptive. There's no escaping it, no matter your feelings about monarchy in Britain, right? There's so much changing, so much about to change from the money to the national anthem to also uh, the inescapable public ceremonies that we're going to see over this next week or so. I think that um, you, have, you have stuff being canceled. You have from media, television, and so on to sort of certain businesses, activities, um, a, a big carnival that was planned in Hackney shutting down uh, because of this, which people have mixed feelings about. Um, you have uh, at every level of, of life, um, this is a huge change. And just the, the, the weirdness of British people talking about the fundamental strangeness of saying uh, King Charles instead of the Queen as, you know, at least um, among millennials, as their parents and their grandparents said, um, that change is, is going to fundamentally rock people, um, even when they say that they don't care or it doesn't affect them or so on. Of course it does. 
Washington Post Opinions editor Autumn Brewington is the author of a new newsletter for the Washington Post on the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, and she joins me now. Autumn, what is your focus today here as we, as we start to mark this first full day uh, without Queen Elizabeth II? is really about seeing how Charles leads. It was really interesting that, you know, immediately upon arriving in London, he got out of the car and he greeted people and we saw him, you know, interacting with that crowd. Um, obviously, people who are gathering outside of Buckingham Palace are likely to be supporters of the monarchy or people who are really sympathetic to the royal family. But I thought it was quite interesting how many people were you know, sounding tearful as they said, um, long live the king, and just expressed, you know, their feelings to him. One woman kissed him, didn't seem like she asked permission, you know, so he was, he was greeted very positively. And, you know, for a person who for a long time has had, you know, kind of questions swirling around him of how would people react to him as king when he's not as, you know, universally popular as his mother was, that was probably a really big boost. Adam, let's watch some of the footage uh, from the Washington Post. This is from mourners this morning outside of Buckingham Palace. I was talking to my sister just now. She called me to sympathize because she knew I was upset about the death of the Queen so soon after the death of my mother, who absolutely adored the Queen, the royal family, and what she stood for, and her love of horses. My mother, all her life, rode horses. She raced. She won the first ladies' race in Kuala Lumpur in 1952. My father met the Queen in Nairobi, and afterwards, when he was in the army, and for me, it brought everything back about my mum just dying and uh, huge respect for the Queen and everything she stood for. One of the mourners the Washington Post spoke to outside of Buckingham Palace today. Autumn, you get the sense there of people seeing the Queen's death in a very personal light, both because of their family connections, but also because of what's going on in their own lives. I mean, it reminds me much of when the way Diana died, that it, it was really almost... Uh, uh, not just the loss of that individual, but also the loss of whatever that meant in your life. The loss of a dream, the loss of a symbol, the loss of youth, the loss of promise. It, it means even more than the individual. Um, I think that's totally true. And I thought it was really interesting. In London a couple of weeks ago, I was standing outside Kensington Palace uh, the weekend before the 25th anniversary of Diana's death, and already people were putting up photos and banners and saying, you know, we come every year, we come on her birthday and we come on this anniversary because she just meant so much to us. I think one of the post columnists, Monica Hess, had written either yesterday or today in, you know, sort of uh, complimenting how the queen had done her job. The queen was, you know, something you could count on. Like she was such a constant in life, like death and taxes. She was always there. You always knew, you know, she was reliable. She could be counted on. And um, so many people, I think, are just sort of expressing the loss of that presence that was so familiar. Talk to us about the evolution of the Queen Autumn from you know, a young princess into a grandmother figure and leader for the nation. And that's, I mean, it is really such an extraordinary thing. You sort of hear that quote that's been going around um, on social media over the past day and a half, how her first prime minister was born in 1874, and her most recent prime minister was born in 1975. But when you think about just sort of the arc of the queen's reign, she comes to the throne at age 25. She's a young mother of, you know, two. She was so glamorous, you know, in the ball gowns and just, it, it was sort of this, you know, kind of wonderful image um, for a country, you know, coming still out of World War II and kind of regaining its footing. Like she just seemed, you know, such this glamorous young queen. And then um, over the years, she really, you know, grew into the job, but also grew through her life. And in, you know, the 60s and 70s, you kind of see her go through, you know, she's entered into sort of more middle age. And then you had kind of the Diana era and, you um, Diana and Fergie and then William and Harry and like you sort of see the younger generations um, kind of catching popular imagination. But I think one thing that was sort of 
really interesting how Queen Elizabeth II came to be seen as a sort of grandmother of the nation figure was really after her own mother passed. Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, passed away in 2001. Then all of a sudden, I think the queen who had been in a space between sort of, you know, her early years as such a glamorous figure, and then as she was getting older, then she kind of really had the space in the popular imagination to be sort of that grandmother role for the nation. We're looking at images from outside Buckingham Palace. Hannah Jewell, as we think about Queen Elizabeth, I mean, many of us do think about the last years of her life and that image of almost the grandmother type. Um, but how much is the Queen Elizabeth of earlier decades on the mind of people in the United Kingdom as they think about her legacy and what she leaves behind? Well, as we were just hearing, she, she just was so young when she took the throne in her 20s. And you kind of can see almost this, this arc, maybe, of the way that human be beings feel about women at different ages of their lives. You have the sort of celebrated young glamour. You have the, the sort of middle-aged years, where, where is when she had her, her bad years, dealing with the fallout, the divorces of her children, the scandals and so on, um, less warm feelings, lower public polling about the royal family, the queen specifically, and then you see her emerge into these elder years of becoming then sort of beloved grandmother figure, and there's this arc in this life, which I think that is the one, the, the elder years, because she has lived so long has been you know this this grandmother age for for the vast majority of what most people remember um, who are alive in Britain today I think that that is the image that will that will last on longer more so than than the earlier times and I think that's probably uh, what uh, what the royal family those who who who, who work and, and and try to control this image would prefer of course it's going to be strange to go, you know, Charles, not a young man, but in his 70s to sort of um, revert back to a, a, a patriarch in the most literal, uh, fundamental sense of that and how different that feels to the sort of the feminized monarch and the, the idea of um, having this grandmother figure. Will there be that sort of same familiar tone or will it be more sort of jarring to have a king? Libby? Yeah, you know, James, it is so interesting to think of that, uh, the... the, the the, the patrimonial, the patriarchal image of Charles, because up till now, he's really been the subordinate, right? And he's sort of captured in our minds as the subordinate, and, and, and that symbolized in many different ways. Um, and so will the public be able to see him now in this new role, not just as leader, but as almost father figure of the nation? They're going to have to, but it will be a transition. Uh, you know, for those of us who watched The Crown, uh, you know, the image we have of Charles as, as a petulant young man, uh, you know, dealing with uh, being sent to boarding school, which he himself in real life has talked about uh, how his parents were distant and he was sent to this uh, Scottish boarding school that emphasized privation as a way to build character. Uh, and so he grew up obviously in lavish luxury, but also uh, with, with, you know, a, a mother and a father who were quite distant. Uh, and all of his challenges with Diana and on and on and on. And, you know, now he's a 73-year-old man. Uh, and it is, you know, we talk about how that's pretty old, but uh, that is, you know, five years younger than our, <laughs> our president and uh, former president. And, and it also is, you know, if, if he lives as long as his mother, he could potentially have a 23-year-long reign. And his uh, father lived to 99. And his father lived yeah. to 99. He does have good genes on both sides. Mm -hmm. So he could be king for another two decades. And, uh, you know, he's someone who has been in good health. He survived. He was one of the first people, he was one of the very first world leaders to get COVID back in early 2020. And he, he survived uh, before vaccines or anything like that. So it, it, we don't know how long he's going to be here. And if he has the same sense of duty of, of, in, in, in view of the job that his mother had, he's not going to abdicate and hand off power to his son until the, the very, very end. Mm. We are about a half hour away from what we expect to be an address from 
King Charles III. This will be pre-recorded and delivered, something that the United Kingdom, the Commonwealth, and frankly the world will be curious to hear and see. As we've been hearing from Hannah and others reflecting on the Queen's life and sort of some of the indelig indelible images uh, in her later years, we've also heard about her sense of humor. So let's take a look at this clip from the Queen's Platinum Jubilee celebrations with none other than Paddington Bear. <laughs> Perhaps you would like a marmalade sandwich. I always keep one for emergencies. So do I. I keep mine in here. Oh. For later. And that is from uh, the celebration from the Jubilee. Uh, so much speculation, of course, about why the Queen would carry that pocketbook around uh, as she was really in her own home. She was never seen uh, without that pocketbook. But Hannah Jewell, she would talk about the utility of just being able to sort of keep her tissues and such on hand. But I would certainly keep a marmalade uh, sandwich in my pocketbook if I carried it everywhere. Sounding pretty good right now, Libby, actually. Yeah, this is just one of the um, the ways that the sort of queen brand, we can say, was sort of cemented with her her hats matching her outfits, uh, with her handbags also matching, and, and this image. Um, if you were to try and dress up as the queen, you would know exactly what to do for that reason. But um, it wasn't that often that you saw her participate in those sort of pop culture moments like that video with, with Paddington Wright. Of course, who can forget the 2020 London um, Olympics opening ceremony where she, you know, appeared to parachute with James Bond um, into the, the stadium on the, um, on the uh, part, as part of that opening ceremony. And then she emerges, of course, it was a stunt double doing the actual parachuting. But I think this was such a thing that people really loved to see and sort of um, really contributed to her image as this sort of like grandmother figure and, and perhaps helped to project a more warm figure, whereas in the past she had been critiqued for exactly that, um, participating in those sorts of cultural moments with the world watching, um, really sort of added to this, this image for her and the royal family. You know, James, the reason why those moments resonate is because they're sort of discreet and unique, right? It's not like a shtick where every week we would see someone like the Queen hamming it up with a character. So how does Charles think about that? How does Charles think about humanizing his image, seeming a little bit accessible, and yet maintaining that sort of professional dignity that his mother strove for? You always have to keep them wanting more. Mm. Uh, and the steak has to sizzle. Uh, you know, you have to keep a little uh, distance. You can't be too familiar. And that was one of the challenges during the Diana divorce, was we heard these audio tapes of Charles talking to Camilla and you know we heard we just heard a lot of stuff that you know today I think the term we'd use was TMI uh, and you want to know that your royals are human but you don't want them to be too human you want them to be uh, you, know, you want them to be a little bit better than you <laughs> in, in the British view uh, you, you don't want them to be just like us um, uh, but the it really is remarkable, you know, when you look at the polling, the lower classes have the fondest uh, views of the queen. Uh, you know, they, they uh, these are, are poor folks, uh, but they're the ones who have pictures of her hanging in their dining rooms and their kitchens. And it is because she has created that aura of accessibility and frugality, uh, but also dignity. So, you know, Hannah, there is the question of the illusion of it all, right? And sort of the, as we were talking about the magic that it is in the royal family's best interest to maintain um, because it then equals power, it equals control, and it equals survival. Um, so, so how are you thinking about how young Britons approach this week of mourning and transition uh, as they greet King Charles III? Well, what James was just saying about this sort of the, uh, the popularity of her among, you know, all British people, but, but working class people in particular, uh, but being less popular potentially among younger folks is that um, if you think about it, the, the royal family is sort of the fundamental underpinning of, of the class system in Britain. Uh, they, they exist. They're, they're, 
their, their line of succession is based on the premise that your importance in this one way, your value, um, your, your ability to take power is determined merely because of the order you were born in, the family you were born to, um, the inheritance that that comes with. Um, and so you have the, this family that is sort of trying to balance this being accessible, being um, and certainly with Charles, it will be a, a, a big task for him to try and sort of relate to British people in a time when they're heading into these really time of unmanageable energy bills. Managing that while also being the, you know, this, the inheritor of, of millions upon millions of dollars worth of land and money that's happening right now, I, I think there's so much opportunity for, you know, for, for gaffes, for misspeaking. But um, well, we'll see today this pre-taped speech, um, how he addresses British people and, and their current troubles. Um, but they have, for so many people, sort of transcended that, that fundamental truth of, of their, their class, their betterness um, as inherited from birth to, to win the hearts of so many. The Queen certainly managed to do that. Um, and, and Will Charles is, is the question to ask going forward. Hmm. Adam Brewington, talk to us more about the role now of Charles and what he has to grow into and how, Autumn, he has been preparing this really uh, preparing himself for this for years, uh, but there's something very different about when it actually comes upon you. Oops, I think we're getting some mixed signals here. Let's try once again to get Autumn. Autumn, uh, go ahead, let's try that again. Okay, I, he's grown up in the public eye, but he's never been the absolute center of you know attention sort of in the like literal number one spot the way that he is now. He was born to be king. And so for 73 years, it's been a matter of, you know, this is your destiny. This will be the great thing that you do. This is what you're, you know, working toward. This is what you're studying for. This is what you're going into the armed services for. This is what you will do. All of these, you know, very regimented things for. Um, he's had more hands-on training than any previous monarch in British history, just by virtue of being the longest waiting sort of, sovereign in waiting, um, but also to be so close to his mother for so many years as an adult, you know, she took the throne at age 25, he's 73. He's had decades of seeing how she handled things, um, you know, her approach to different situations and dealing with world leaders and a lot of, you know, the press that has surrounded Charles in uh, recent years is sort of looking at, well, he's reached out to government ministers, he seems involved in politics in the way, in a way that the Queen isn't. And now he's in a position where, you know, when he gives a speech, um, his big speeches are written for him by the government. Like that's, there have always been questions of would he be comfortable being in a role that traditionally has been apolitical? Would he change that? So there's so much, you know, to watch for in the coming days and weeks. You're seeing images of St. Paul's Cathedral, and we do expect a memorial service at St. Paul's tonight. While uh, King Charles is not expected to attend, uh, we do expect to see Prime Minister Liz Truss, as well as other uh, leaders. Coming up in just about 20 minutes' time, King Charles III gives his address to the British people, the Commonwealth, and really to the world, since he commands a global audience in many respects in this modern era. Autumn, uh, this is a moment for King Charles to show the world his tone, his manner, and, and how he plans to take on this role. What will you be listening for? I think I'm listening to hear how inclusive he is, how responsive he is, um, and just the tone that he puts forth, whether it is something that, you know, if he's trying to show that he wants to lead a modern monarchy into the 21st century, or um, how much he's, you know, kind of looking to adhere to or potentially break from tradition. You know, one of the things that we'll be watching but things that we've already actually gotten signals about. Like traditionally, when a British sovereign died, the court mourning period was for a year, like an entire year. That's why there was always such a long break between when one sovereign passed and when the next one was crowned, because they had this long mourning period, and then they would make arrangements for a coronation. Um, it was a big deal in 1953 when the Queen's grandmother died a few months before her coronation, 
and Queen Mary left explicit instructions that her death was not to derail the coronation because she did not want an extended mourning period to prevent the queen from being crowned on schedule. So now we're seeing, you know, in sort of in this, in a much more modern era with um, Prince Philip's death last year, the queen asked that the mourning period be two weeks. And now King Charles has asked for the mourning period for his mother to be seven days, I think, after the funeral. So it'll be a little over two weeks. And then, you know, we'll be hearing about plans for his coronation. It's, we just, we live in a, you know, modern world where things happen quickly. And so that's part of, you know, we saw with the contrast yesterday between how uh, the world was notified that the queen had died and Charles had become king versus how long it took for the queen herself to learn when she became queen, you know, so many things have changed. And the monarchy is an institution that's built on tradition. It is all about doing things the way that they've historically been done. So for them to modernize isn't just a matter of, okay, yeah, we'll do something different. It's really thinking through, okay, so what's the precedent here? What are we letting go of? What does it make sense to update for? It was a really big step for them just, you know, within the past 10 years that they got rid of primogeniture. It's still a system where um, it, your, line, your place in the line of succession is based on age, but it's no longer based on age and you know, male children jump ahead of female children. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's really a, an institution that is rooted in tradition and watching how they're willing to update and amend those traditions will be a very big deal. Rhonda Colvin, how much pressure is on now King Charles today and this speech? I would say there's a lot of pressure. This is almost a reintroduction to Charles. Uh, Most people know him. Of course, he was four years old when his mother uh, had her coronation, so he's been on the world stage uh, since pretty much birth. But this is obviously the first time in this type of capacity. So this speech that we are anticipating in about 15 minutes, of course, is pre-recorded, but it's one that uh, I would say the world is watching. Everyone wants to learn more about the tone. Uh, They want to see him. Of course, uh, we saw him earlier uh, doing the walkabout with uh, the new queen consort, Camilla. Um, And we saw his interaction with the people, but this is a speech that is going to be going out globally. So this is the opportunity and and chance for Charles to reintroduce himself and and for all of us to get used to him in this role. I would say that when we're thinking about how how will he be as king, will he continue some of uh, the traditions that she had, um, I would say that that walkabout this morning was uh, pretty important because that was actually a tradition she created back in the 70s. Queen Elizabeth uh, decided to get out of the car in a trip uh, when she was on tour in Australia and New Zealand to meet with the people, meet and greet. And before, people really didn't get access to the royal family. They saw them from a distance, they saw them from balconies, they saw them in cars, but they never got to shake hands before she created that. So that was a, a pretty significant moment for uh, royal history, and he started started, you know, his day doing just that. So I'm interested to see uh, the type of tone that he's going to bring to this speech. And, and is he going to present himself as a people's king? James Homan, uh, let's talk about the expectations that are on Charles in this moment and beyond. I mean, one of the questions is, how much does he look back and reflect on his mother's life and, and her legacy? And how much does he begin to pivot and turn his head forward? He has to look back in this, his first speech. Uh, he, he can't just look forward. He it, it needs to mourn his mother, uh, not just uh, his own mom, but also the, the mother of the Commonwealth. Uh, you know, he uh, is descending from a monarchy that is more than a thousand years old, that's existed since 1066. And he is, uh, the, you know, a direct descendant of the original Norman conquerors. Uh, it's interesting because he's Charles III, uh, but he actually, uh, you know, he, he, he hopes that he has a, a better go of it than the previous two King Charleses. He could have chosen any uh, of his four names to be his official king title. He could have been King Charles, King Philip, King Anthony, uh, or I'm sorry, King Arthur, or King George, uh, but he went with Charles. Uh, Charles I was, of course, uh, caught up in the English Civil War and beheaded by Oliver Cromwell. 
uh, didn't end well. He was born in Scotland in 1600. What happened was that he married a Catholic girl, and that upset Parliament quite a bit. Uh, they booted the king from England. England descended into civil war. The king was captured, tried for treason, and beheaded. Charles II uh, spent the first decade of his reign in exile. Uh, he was 18 when his father was killed. It was a, a chilly January day in 1649, and uh, Charles I asked for an extra shirt because he didn't want to be seen as uh, shivering in the cold, lest his subjects think he was shivering in fear. Anyway, then Charles II took over when uh, he was 30 years old, uh, and he, uh, he definitely held a grudge. He had Oliver Cromwell dug up from his grave uh, and beheaded, even though he was already dead. Uh, so Charles III, uh, who we're seeing there, is a, is a direct descendant. Uh, of that family, and that history is top of mind for the British. As Hannah was noting earlier, British school children learn all of this. The, the, they learn the history. This is who they are. This is part of their national identity. Charles can't escape that. We're looking now at this uh, slideshow of the life of Prince Charles, now King Charles III. Um, Hannah, his evolution uh, is certainly one that we've witnessed as he's been in the shadow of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II. I think that uh, it's, it's sort of a question of waiting in the wings for so long. Um, how much did he enjoy being, you know, not being the king for such a long time? We can never really know the answer to these questions, but, you know, he, he had his pursuits, his sort of quieter life, of course, after the really public scandal and drama of the 90s. You've seen him in recent years emerging more to take up more royal events and more royal duties. Um, and uh, but but never being, you know, never having the buck stock with him in the royal family as an institution. Um, now, uh, as he's known, he always would end up, um, it, it will do, and he will be the figurehead, and he will be the fundamentally the, the one tasked with with uh, with protecting the the legacy and the image and the legitimacy of the royal family in Britain. Autumn, uh, as you look at that slideshow and images of the life of Charles thus far, uh, what stands out to you? I think it's really interesting just that he's had such a range of experiences. And, you know, we've we've certainly heard from him, particularly in um, more recent years, about his interest in climate and organic um, sort of healthy food, sustainable um, projects, but just he is someone actually who had served in the military and he went to Cambridge and he's sort of dabbled in a variety of different things. His role has exposed him to so many different things and it sort of feeds into kind of what's useful, um, or what the royal family is sort of very good at, which is convening people, like bringing people together um, from, you know, different walks of life, different um, areas of like the economy or just different industries and kind of making connections that then allow um, promotion of different causes. Uh, Rhonda, we are looking at images of St. Paul Cathedral and we do expect to see this ceremony of remembrance later on. And uh, we will see Prime Minister Trust there as well as former British Prime Ministers expected. Uh, I'm just going to roll through the list because it's quite a who's who of leaders of the United Kingdom. Uh, Boris Johnson, Theresa May, David Cameron, uh, Blair, Brown, Major. I mean, we're really seeing this list of men and women who uh, who held those regular meetings with Queen Elizabeth II, who got to know her both as a leader and as a person. That's right, and as part of her constitutional duty, she would meet with these prime ministers and uh, we have talked about how earlier this week, just a few days ago, she uh, was a part of that transition uh, and, and where she went from Prime Minister uh, Johnson to Prime Minister Trust. This is one of her last actions. And it, it sort of speaks to that sense of duty that we've been discussing for the last day, uh, that she felt that she uh, wanted to continue to serve her people. So you saw that throughout her entire time on the throne. You saw it this week. 
that being her last action. And you also see that those that relationship she had with prime ministers uh, in the words that they've expressed in the last day. Uh, many of them talk about how she was an inspiration uh, to them. And, uh, you know, of course, they would probably speak uh, favorably of her right now. But you do get a sense that these words are, are uh, genuine and that they did uh, enjoy those meetings with her and that relationship that, of course, is constitutional. But it also seems, if you look at the history, that she did have very unique uh, experiences with each one of them. Her experience with Margaret Thatcher uh, is, is one that has often been noted. Um, and throughout history, she's had very distinct uh, experiences with these prime ministers. So it's certainly uh, not a shock that they would all show up. But it's also, you know, just a, a unique moment, once again, where you see modern uh, British history playing out in the fact that they are all there uh, memorializing her. You know, Hannah, one question will be how that relationship that King Charles has with prime ministers advances in the future. And you wonder how much of that role as queen and now king is listening versus talking, right? Just receiving versus advising and opining, Hannah. It's hard not to imagine that for Charles, he will he will be more on the opining side of things, you know, listening as well, giving this advice. But he is certainly someone who who has a lot of feelings um, on on many topics that we've been discussing, um, particularly on the environment and climate. He he was a, a a presence at the climate conference in Glasgow last year. He uh, he has really like he appears on TV and nature programs talking about. Um, conservation and so on. And, and we have in Liz Truss someone who is appointed recently an energy minister who sort of questions the, the reality of or the or indeed the, the, the badness of global warming as a concept fundamentally. So, uh, you know, Charles will know this. Um, Liz Truss will will be there. And, and I think that's one topic in which they may they may um, differ. It's sort of hard to say. There's this there's this line that that Charles obviously isn't meant to cross that, um, but these are private audiences, and so anything can happen, and and we will be none the wiser. Um, but also, they 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 are united in this really more fundamental sort of uh, shocking experience of of being the brand new versions of of what they are now, of, of ascending at the same time to elected power and to inherited power. Elected, I should say, like Liz Truss was actually not brought in an election, but in a sort of small sliver of conservative party members. But nevertheless, she has this big legitimacy that she has to build in these early days in a similar way that, that Charles does. Autumn, what will you be listening for from uh, King Charles's speech this afternoon, our time, anticipating it in about less than 10 minutes away, uh, 6 o'clock London time? Sorry, you said what are we listening for? What will you be anticipating? What will you be listening for? I'm I'm listening for him to to express some sentiment and also to he he is going to acknowledge the length and just sort of the the record breaking nature of his mother's reign but he will probably also allow some personal notes he wants to make a connection with people he has spent a life sort of on on display leading up to this moment it's not really um it's not really typical for him to let people in too much but the palace is very good at sprinkling personal moments into things like we saw you know at the jubilee when he referred to your majesty and then mummy and People respond very positively to what feels like, you know, these really personal moments. And right now, I think actually part of the reason that we're going to see a recorded speech from uh, the new king in a few minutes is because this is the day after his mother died. This is very much a public event, but this is also a family in a public role. And we're, you know, we're seeing someone who has to lead while he mourns. And so right now, I think the job in front of him is to connect with people and also to, you know, highlight the Queen's long service and, you know, acknowledge um, what a great uh, leader she had been, but also set the tone for how he will lead. And part of that is, you know, trying to connect with people and showing sort of his human side. As James was saying, people want 
people want to feel some connection with their royal family, although they don't want them to be too human. Mm-hmm. Royals, the trick has, you know, long been that they don't want to, they don't want to be too normal because if they're too normal, then, you know, what makes them special or different? Why should they be treated any differently than anyone else? Just moments away uh, from the speech of King Charles III, it is a day to look back and also a day to look forward. To that end, let's check out the front pages of UK papers today and how they are honoring their queen. You can see their papers uh, from uh, the Daily Telegraph uh, to the paper in Manchester honoring Queen Elizabeth II and her 96 years of life, her 70 years on the throne. And this is the front page of the Washington Post today. I will hold this up. You can see here we've got uh, this as well, this image, this uh, striking image of a young Queen Elizabeth II. James, um, this is both that combination of a look back and a look forward. It really is. It's, uh, it's you know, Literally, the BBC has been planning for the death of the Queen since the early 1960s. And all these newspapers have had their coverage ready to go. And there's a lot of retrospectives. Uh, There's a lot of analysis of her legacy and just how different the world is than when she became Queen. Uh, The day that she was coronated was the day that word got to London that Edmund Hillary had planted the Union Jack on the top of Mount Everest. That's how long ago. Uh, it's just, it's hard to capture uh, how much different the empire looked then. The sun never set on the British Empire. We're uh, seeing images of the ceremony inside St. Paul's Cathedral. We have talked about how uh, so many prime ministers are there uh, to, to honor uh, Queen Elizabeth II. This is just really the first in a series of events that will do so over the coming days. Yeah, that's right. Going back, you listed all the names to John Major, yeah. uh, who took over from Margaret Thatcher, the, the hero for Liz Truss, the new prime minister. This is a moment... Uh, for I think all, it's every living prime minister. Every living prime, prime minister, minister, is prime minister is going to be there. The list, remarkable, yeah. considering that she died yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it shows just how central in this constitutional monarchy uh, it is to the, the relationships they had, the lunches every Tuesday, the audiences, uh, the private confidences. Uh, the, she, the queen was this seminal figure, uh, the, the glue that held together the, you know, the, the, these two roles, head of government, head of state. And the queen made sure that that went seamlessly. Uh, those conversations did not leak. Uh, it, it's, it's hard. It's a, you know, this, this two hat sort of system is difficult to make work and it really depends on uh, the, the people in the job. And that's, uh, we're gonna get a, a measure of the man. Uh, in the next few minutes. In addition to uh, former prime ministers, uh, we're also seeing a Labor Party leader and and others uh, attending this. In just a few moments, of course, even as we watch this service of remembrance, uh, we will also be watching the first public speech of King Charles III. So far, we've only caught glimpses of him in transit down from Barmoral Castle uh, to London. And then he went outside of Buckingham Palace earlier today and uh, met with well-wishers and mourners there standing outside. Uh, He and his wife, Camilla, now Queen Consort Camilla, watched and looked at all of the flowers and and other gifts that had been left in honor of his mother. Uh, Let's go now to this prepared speech. We have dual images here, St. Paul's Cathedral, as well as the prepared remarks, uh, his first address to the world from now King Charles III. This was recorded in the Blue Room in Buckingham Palace, a prepared speech, uh, pre-recorded, and we will watch now. I speak to you today with feelings of profound sorrow. Throughout her life, Her Majesty the Queen, my beloved mother, was an inspiration, an example to me and to all my family. And we owe her the most heartfelt debt any family could owe to their mother for her love, affection, guidance, 
understanding and example. Queen Elizabeth was a life well lived, a promise with destiny kept, and she is mourned most deeply in her passing. That promise of lifelong service I renew to you all today. Alongside the personal grief that all my family are feeling, we also share with so many of you in the United Kingdom, in all the countries where the Queen was head of state, in the Commonwealth and across the world, a deep sense of gratitude for the more than 70 years in which my mother as Queen served the people of so many nations. In 1947, on her 21st birthday, she pledged in a broadcast from Cape Town to the Commonwealth to devote her life, whether it be short or long, to the service of her peoples. That was more than a promise. It was a profound personal commitment which defined her whole life. She made sacrifices for duty. Her dedication and devotion as sovereign never wavered through times of change and progress, through times of joy and celebration, and through times of sadness and loss. In her life of service, we saw that abiding love of tradition, together with that fearless embrace of progress, which makes us great as nations. The affection, admiration, and respect she inspired became the hallmark of her reign. And as every member of my family can testify, she combined these qualities with warmth, humor, and an unerring ability always to see the best in people. I pay tribute to my mother's memory, and I honor her life of service. I know that her death brings great sadness to so many of you, and I share that sense of loss beyond measure with you all. When the Queen came to the throne, Britain and the world were still coping with the privations and aftermath of the Second World War, and still living by the conventions of earlier times. In the course of the last 70 years, we have seen our society become one of many cultures and many faiths. The institutions of the state have changed in turn. But through all changes and challenges, our nation and the wider family of realms, of whose talents, traditions, and achievements I am so inexpressibly proud, have prospered and flourished. Our values have remained, and must remain, constant. The role and the duties of monarchy also remain, as does the sovereign's particular relationship and responsibility towards the Church of England, the church in which my own faith is so deeply rooted. In that faith and the values it inspires, I have been brought up to cherish a sense of duty to others and to hold in the greatest respect the precious traditions, freedoms, and responsibilities of our unique history and our system of parliamentary government. As the Queen herself did with such unswerving devotion, I too now solemnly pledge myself throughout the remaining time God grants me to uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. And wherever you may live in the United Kingdom or in the realms and territories across the world, and whatever may be your background or beliefs, I shall endeavor to serve you with loyalty, respect, 
and love as I have throughout my life. My life will, of course, change as I take up my new responsibilities. It will no longer be possible for me to give so much of my time and energies to the charities and issues for which I care so deeply. But I know this important work will go on in the trusted hands of others. This is also a time of change for my family. I count on the loving help of my darling wife, Camilla. In recognition of her own loyal public service since our marriage 17 years ago, she becomes my queen consort. I know she will bring to the demands of her new role the steadfast devotion to duty on which I have come to rely so much. As my heir, William now assumes the Scottish titles which have meant so much to me. He succeeds me as Duke of Cornwall and takes on the responsibilities for the Duchy of Cornwall, which I have undertaken for more than five decades. Today, I am proud to create him Prince of Wales, to Wissog Cymru, the country whose title I have been so greatly privileged to bear during so much of my life and duty. With Catherine beside him, our new Prince and Princess of Wales will, I know, continue to inspire and lead our national conversations, helping to bring the marginal to the centre ground where vital help can be given. I want also to express my love for Harry and Meghan as they continue to build their lives overseas. In a little over a week's time, we will come together as a nation, as a commonwealth, and indeed a global community, to lay my beloved mother to rest. In our sorrow, let us remember and draw strength from the light of her example. On behalf of all my family, I can only offer the most sincere and heartfelt thanks for your condolences and support. They mean more to me than I can ever possibly express. And to my darling Mama, as you begin your last great journey to join my dear late Papa, I want simply to say this. Thank you. Thank you for your love and devotion to our family and to the family of nations you have served so diligently all these years. May flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. A life well lived, King Charles III remembering his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, recalling her duty and dedication and her connection to the people, her service and her faith. Charles also solemnly pledging himself to his new duty. Now this is just the first day of many ahead of remembrance and days that will look ahead to the new monarchy. Our Washington Post team will be with you covering all of this live, so please do stay with us in the coming days. Let's go now to St. Paul's Cathedral and a service of remembrance of the life of Queen Elizabeth II.
we shall not all die, but we shall be changed. The trumpet shall sound, and the dead will rise immortal, and we shall be changed. The perishable must be clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal must be clothed with immortality. We shall not all die. With proud thanksgiving, we gather in this cathedral today to mourn the death of our sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II. We remember her long life spent in the service of this country and of her Commonwealth realms around the world. We give thanks for a life of devotion to God, her creator, redeemer, and sustainer, and of devotion to all her people. As we call to mind the promise made at her coronation that all her judgments should be guided by law, justice, and mercy, we rejoice in her steady acceptance of this vocation. We celebrate her love for her family, her commitment to duty, and her calling to create unity and concord at the heart of the Commonwealth. We pray for the royal family as they mourn their loss. We pray too for our most gracious sovereign Lord, the King, that placing all his trust in God, he too may rule over us in peace with justice and compassion. So let us pray. Eternal Lord God, you hold all souls in life. Send forth, we pray, upon your servant Elizabeth and upon your whole church in earth and heaven, the brightness of your light and peace. And grant that we, following the good example of those who have faithfully served you here and are now at rest, may at the last enter with them into the fullness of eternal joy, in Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. An anthem by Herbert Howells.
The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me, he has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. The Old Testament reading from the Reverend Canon Dr. Neil Evans.
the Prime Minister. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Prime Minister, with a reading from the Book of Romans. that great Wesleyan hymn. May I speak in the name the of Bishop God, of who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. A life lived in the service of others is a rare jewel. It is a jewel that Her Late Majesty the Queen wore as a crown. Today we gather in this cathedral church with those across our nation 
the Commonwealth and the world with a profound sadness as we mourn her death. In doing so, we mark and celebrate the life of an extraordinary dedicate, which was dedicated to others. During her coronation at Westminster Abbey, almost 70 years ago, the young queen was anointed before God. With sesame and olive oil, containing orange flowers, roses, jasmine, cinnamon and musk. Her life was set apart for the service of others. This act of anointing was so sacred that she was hidden from view and covered by a golden canopy, a rare moment of privacy in a life to be lived in full view of millions. Her Majesty's sense of vocation and calling was not something she could pick up and put down again. It was deeply embedded in her understanding of herself. In the spirit of our reading from St Paul's letters to the Romans, she did not live to herself, nor has she died to herself. Most of us have not known life without the Queen. When she ascended to the throne, the world and the country were both very different places. For seven decades, Her Majesty remained a remarkable constant in the lives of millions, a symbol of unity, strength, forbearance and resilience. She has been this nation's unerring heartbeat through times of progress, joy and celebration as well as in much darker and more difficult seasons. In a message released on Accenture Day, she wrote, in this special year, as I dedicate anew to your service, I hope we will be reminded of the power of togetherness and the convening strength of family, friendship and good neighbourliness. As we mourn her loss, give thanks for her life, and reorientate ourselves as individuals and a nation to life without Her Majesty. May her words remind us of the power and strength to be found in coming together. All of us are grieving the loss of our Head of State head of Commonwealth and Supreme Governor of the Church of England. But the royal family are grieving the loss of a mother, a grandmother, a great-grandmother. How we learn to live the, with de the death of a loved one differs for each one of us, but we must all find a way to grieve. As the theologian Tom Wright said, not to grieve, not to lament, is to slam the door on the same place in the innermost heart from which love itself comes. We may not know the power of that love until the moment of loss. For as the writer Kail Jabran wisely observes, love knows not its own death, depth until the hour of separation. When we are bereaved, we need to make opportunities individually and together to face and absorb the death of, uh, depth of our loss. Yet we are also invited into the healing love of God which never falters, and which is the deepest and widest perspective of our lives. It is a perspective beautifully expressed by the writer of Deuteronomy, who tells us that underneath are the everlasting arms. 
even in the midst of our grief, we are enfolded in that all-encompassing love. As a Christian, I believe that death is not the end. That gives me hope, even in the worst of times. To speak of hope is not to deny the fear, the loss and the anguish which death brings. Jesus himself stood with Mar Martha and Mary at the tomb of his beloved friend Lazarus and wept, wholly undone by grief. But in that cameo, we have the assurance of God's presence in the world's pain and a model for our response to human suffering. God is there for us and we are called to be there for others. The word of the prophet Isaiah assures us that the spirit of the Lord is at work and will bind up the brokenhearted, comfort those who mourn and give them a garland instead of ashes and the oil of gladness instead of mourning. Her Majesty had a remarkable Christian faith about which she had increasingly spoken in recent years, referring to Jesus Christ as her anchor and role model. Here in this cathedral church on the 3rd of June, we join to celebrate her platinum jubilee. The Archbishop of York spoke of her faith in Jesus Christ as a fountain and a well upon which she drew deeply and by which she was replenished through the challenges and joys of life. If Christ was her anchor, her husband, the late Prince Philip, in her own words was Her Majesty's strength and stay. Yet even in the depths of her own mourning, we saw once again her courage and her instinct for putting the need or needs of others first. At her coronation all those years ago, she walked up the aisle of Westminster Abbey, straight past the throne and knelt at the high altar in silent prayer. She gave her allegiance to God before anyone gave allegiance to her. The depth, the breadth, and the generosity of Her Majesty's self-giving in service was an extraordinary gift. And I am certain it has gladdened God's heart. No words can encompass how much we owe Her Late Majesty the Queen. She will be profoundly and greatly missed. My prayers are with the royal family at this time, that they may know in the midst of their loss that underneath are the everlasting arms. In the words of Simeon, when after a long life lived in faithfulness, he met with God incarnate. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. Amen. The Nunc Dimittis.
Let us pray. God of our journey, you have called us to follow in the way of Christ, even to death. By the victory of the cross, lead your faithful servant, Elizabeth, through death to resurrection, where Christ has gone before. Lord, in your mercy. Saving God, you have promised your salvation to all who trust in you. Bring her with all your saints to your eternal presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ever-living God, you have promised new life to all who are found in Christ. Clothe her with the life of Christ, whom not even death could hold. Lord, in your mercy. Eternal God, all our days depend on you, for you are the giver of all good gifts. Grant us with her the life of your eternal joy and peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Trusting in the compassion of God, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Eternal God, we pray for ourselves, as we pray for Elizabeth, our departed sovereign. We stand where earth and heaven meet, where life is brought to death, and death is made the gate to glory. Deliver us from fear and doubt, from despair and unbelief, and bring us all to the light of your presence. Grant us that peace which the world cannot give, so that we with her may trust in you and find our life in you. We make our prayer through Jesus Christ our Saviour in life and death, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. The 23rd Psalm.
The souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died. But they are at peace. Their hope is full of immortality. Piper plays the lament, the flowers of the forest. Lord Jesus, our Redeemer, you willingly gave yourself up to death so that all might be saved and pass from death to life. By dying, you unlocked the gates of life for all those who believe in you. So we commend your faithful servant, Elizabeth, into your arms of mercy, 
believing that with sins forgiven, she will share a place of happiness, light, and peace in the kingdom of your glory forever. Amen. Rest eternal grant unto her, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon her. May she rest in peace.
the Archbishop of Canterbury. God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the Church, the King, the Commonwealth and all people, peace and concord, and to us and to all his servants, life everlasting, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Save the King had in this cathedral for the first time for many a long year, bringing to an end this service of prayer and reflection in thanksgiving for the life of Queen Elizabeth II. And we heard at the beginning Roy Anika, Royal Editor of the Sunday Times, with me here in the cathedral, a remarkably personal statement by King Charles III, didn't we? I thought that was a spellbinding address by the new king. It was deeply personal. It was a deeply moving tribute to the queen. And it was also very revealing about how differently he views his role now to that of the Prince of Wales. He spoke of his mother's love and affection. He spoke of her unswerving devotion and his sense of loss beyond measure at losing her. He also acknowledged, my life will change and spoke of how he will no longer have the time to dedicate as much as he did to causes and issues he did as a campaigning Prince of Wales. He also conferred the titles of the Prince and Princess of Wales on his son and heir, William and Catherine. He spoke of his darling wife, cementing her as Queen Consort. Of course, we know that is a wish that the Her Majesty the Queen had said was her sincere wish that she become Queen Consort at her Platinum Jubilee. He also spoke, interestingly, of Harry and Meghan and expressed, he said, my love for Harry and Meghan as they continue to build their lives overseas. So he used this as a dress after what has been a, a pretty turbulent time for the royal family that's been well documented to be inclusive to all his family. It was, it was a spellbinding, deeply revealing address by the new king. And the beginning of a, an extraordinarily personal service, really. I mean, there were all sort of wonderful moments. Wesleyan hymn, the 23rd Psalm to Crimmond, which the queen knew so well. Uh, lament the flowers of the forest, a, a pipe tune never played except at a, an occasion of remembrance or a funeral, um, a, an anthem with words by John Dunn, who himself was dean of this cathedral. It touched every um, heartstring in this place, I think, and the moving sight, Roya, of that congregation of people who simply decided to come and weren't here, although many members of the cabinet we saw, the, the, the opposition was here, the speaker, but mostly people who simply wanted to come, not because they had to. Absolutely, and of course, all of them there singing, possibly for the first times in their lives, God save the King. Roy Anika, thank you. And so questions, uh, quietness will return to St Paul's when the crowd has gone appropriately for a service devoid of pomp, even at a moment when the crown has passed from mother to son, the King's message, as we've heard, set the tone. And in the last hour for a congregation spanning generations, cultures, and no doubt religious affiliations too, this has been a reflective service and not for a moment ostentatious. For the Cathedral Church of London, surely an illustration of its purpose 
in good times and bad, to allow people to come together. Royal occasions can almost never manage this kind of spontaneity, but today, St. Paul's has been able to catch something of the amalgam of the private and public that we've all seen and heard and experienced for ourselves in these last 24 hours. This time in the cathedral, however, has been peaceful, maybe reassuring, which it was meant to be. People who were here will remember this day. The King's words will rest as evidence of the way he wants the country to remember the Queen and perhaps the challenges that face him now. All this hovers in the air of this beautiful building under Christopher Wren's spreading dome, a place that has heard so much, seen so much, experienced so much, and marking the end of a reign and the beginning of another, allowing everyone to pause and to think of what it means for us all, remembering a long life of great richness and service.
dark eye, just keep uh, adjusting accordingly. Yeah, okay. Thanks. 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 Ha, ha, ha.